Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 159, Play Better Games, damn it. Helping to improve public play game nights. I no longer know what year or day it is, but I'm Sean and with me is Mo, the Tabletop Bellhop himself. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And a big welcome to everyone in our chat room tonight. Good to see you out. So tonight, we've got a question from someone who attended a local gaming event only to be disappointed that all they had to offer were mass market non-hobby games and who's looking for suggestions on helping to improve that game night. After that, I've got a detailed review of the new 2021 edition of Galaxy Trucker, where I'll highlight the subtle changes they made to the game so you know if it's worth picking up or not. Then in our week in review, I've got first thoughts of, on Lost Ruins of Arnak, our first unlock game, and more thoughts on Disney, not Disney Villas, I wrote Disney Villainous, sorry, Disney Sidekicks, and a return to a classic party game, Knit Whip. Welcome to the suggestion box. Where the first suggestion should be, Mo should reread the show notes instead of just typing them once and not going back and looking at them again. But in this segment, we're going to highlight interactions with you fine folk, stuff people have sent us via email or comments on our content. Up first, a quick comment on our Pulsar 2849 review. Timothy Pinkham writes, this was helpful. Thank you. You're welcome, Timothy. I think it's awesome. We continue to see comments and interactions on some of our older content. That's good to see that the stuff's out there and still being found. It doesn't have to be our most released thing or the thing that's live on YouTube in the last hour. I love the fact that people are probably finding it through Google search, but discovering us however they do. Well, speaking of comments on older content, our White Star Galaxy Edition review on YouTube (laughs) continues to grow in popularity and got this comment from Jonathan Baldridge this past week. Now, Stars Without Number Revised seems superior to this game in nearly every respect. Well, thanks for the comment, Jonathan. Um, Again, I'm still kind of shocked that one keeps getting comments somehow. I don't know if we got featured on an OSR blog or what it was, but it's actually one of our most popular videos that doesn't have anything to do with Gloomhaven. Now, Stars Without Number is obviously a more modern game, and that's going to appeal to more people, I think, well, at least modern gamers, right? Where to me, White Star is for old school D&D fans. And by old, I mean as old as possible, like original D&D white box fans, the original version of the game. For those that want traditional D&D in space, I think this is a great option. That's what White Star Galaxy Edition exists for. For most people, though, who have moved on since then or grew up with modern games, things like Stars Without Number, Scum and Villainy, or even the modern licensed games like Fantasy Flight Game Star Wars or Modiphius Star Trek, are probably better choices than this retro clone. But I think there's always going to be a group of gamers out there who refuses to leave the games of the 70s behind, and this game will be there for them. Well, Andre Thanhauser left a number of comments on our Aventuria content, including this reply to our Breakfast for Dinner unscripted show from the end of last year. I think you should always play the short adventures first at least when it comes first in the booklet. The next Aventuria crowdfunding is going to introduce an epic campaign system with more possibilities what to improve when leveling up. For example, it's going to introduce level 2 and level 3 versions of various cards so you can spend XP points to upgrade cards. Furthermore, there will be much more sense why you can play leveled up characters because the average level of your party is going to determine on which difficulty level you should play an adventure scenario. Very Gloomhaven there. Uh, So it balances the difficulty in an official and great way, and you can still play adventures in any order you like. And you can play with heroes who can also be on very different levels without it feeling a bit strange or weird. I gotta say, most of that, all of that, sounds pretty awesome, Andre. I I am really looking forward to these updates. Um, One of the weakest points of the Aventuria system is the character advancement system. There really isn't a lot going on there. And variable difficulty levels sound cool, too. Though what I have to worry about 
how long is this going to be? How long is it going to be before this new crowdfunder launches? And even more so, when are we even going to see that over here in North America? Because as it was, the newest stuff that's supposedly published in 2021 still hasn't shown up here in North America. And we're just very lucky that Ulysses Field reached out to us or else we'd have no clue about this game because we can't find it in stores anywhere. Like, I know there are many of our fans and listeners who are excited to get their hands on this game, especially after our last episode where both of us had it on our top 10 of 2021 games. We talk about this game all the time and no one can get it. So while I love hearing that the next crowdfunding is going to add all this awesome stuff, like, we're going to get that in 2025 at this point? Well, you can hope we'll see it someday. <laughs> Pandemic can't last forever. Well, technically. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, Keith J. Davies had this quick suggestion for our topic of casual games for four to six players. Thorough, quick to teach, quick to play, supports up to eight players. Thanks, Keith. Um, I got to admit, I, I have a bias against Thorough. I just don't think there's enough game there. I never want to sit down to play a game night to play Thorough. I, I never going to go, hey, Let's play Suro tonight and pick that off by the games out of everything I own. Now, where this game does sit for me and why I still have a collection is this is a game to have sitting out there, to have available on a game night so people can pick up and play it when they need to kill time. This is great for when you're in the middle of playing a bunch of games and everyone's always busy and then a couple shows up or a couple people show up or three new people walk in the door and they don't want to start something on their own. This is great. Just break out Suro and they play Suro until other tables open up. Or if you're waiting for a specific table, like there's one copy of Terraforming Mars and they're in the last round and you want to play Terraforming Mars next. Well, to kill that time while they wrap up, play a game of Suro. Or possibly as the last game, you know, you're out at a public play gaming event. It ends at 10 p.m. and it's 4.59. You're like, oh, I got to get one more game in. What can we do and get one more game in? There's where I think Suro fits. Like I do like the game well enough. I love the fact it plays eight players. That is fantastic. It's great for public play. Plus the um the look of it, the table presence is also great for public play events. Ties in good with tonight's topic. So I do think it's worth having, but I'm never going to go, let's play Suro tonight. Hey, Tori and Kat, you're coming over? We're going to start with Suro. It's just not going to happen. Fair enough. Now, our final comment this week comes from Sean's talk about all the superhero RPGs he's, he had been reading. And we had a big discussion about what sets each apart. So I figured I'd read this one off and let Sean handle any comments. So Thomas Peterson writes, I'm going to pick up masks. It's on my radar. Honestly, I have two favorites, Prowlers and Paragons and Cortex Prime, which you touched on by mentioning Marvel Heroic Roleplay. I'm more a fan of the cinematic storytelling. Prowlers and Paragons have mashed the mix of crunch and cinematic. Well, sadly, I still haven't actually played it. I think Thomas is, is pretty much right about Prowlers and Paragons. It really does seem to balance the, uh, the crunch story balance for it pretty well. Though I'm just learning more and more, leaning more and more on the story side, the more I play on Discord. Mm. So without a virtual tabletop or a real tabletop, the crunch just weighs down the game for me. Now for Cortex Prime, I wonder if Thomas is using the giant corporate owned comics heroic role-playing hack uh because the official marvel cortex prime uh is apparently dead in the water thanks to marvel 616 yeah uh the marvel cortex has been dead for a long time even before 616 it's been dead for years well there was still Which talk is... about it there was still hope for it in yes pre, just pre-pandemic or, or very early pandemic but... there was hope for it but not much <laughs> Uh, but I think 616 puts the nail in that coffin for good. Yeah, I think it's gone. Dead and gone. And 616, what I've seen about it, I don't know about that. I know. Not I... looking encouraging. No, it's an it's a mass market RPG. I think is Yeah, but of... using a really funky dice system that just isn't mass market. That's why it doesn't feel mass market to me. Yeah, I don't know. I it's gonna be interesting. I don't know if I'm gonna pay for a to play test for them. Well, so, yes, there is we'll, always uh, that. We'll see. That is something that that's a hill I will die on. I refuse to ever pay to buy a playtest copy of a game. That's not going to, I don't care how collectible it gets or how shiny the cover is or whatever they want to do. They're even doing variant covers of their playtest rule book. And I yeah. just, that's, that's milking as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not drinking from that cow. All right. Well, that's it 
for this week's comments, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a perfect start of the new year question. Phil Hatfield, longtime fan of the show, contacted us on MeWe to say, Okay, Mo, here is a question for you. My local library is running some game nights in my area. I attended the one, I attended the one in September, December, and they have three more planned, one for January, one for February, and one in March. They mostly had games like Scategories, Monopoly, and other mass market style games that you can pick up at your local stores like Target and such. They had a couple of hobby games like Sushi Go Party, Timeline, and one or two others. Needless to say, I have a bit more exposure to games than the group running the event seems to have. I thought about bringing in some simple light games to see if more people would be interested in newer games instead of the same selection I saw there in December. I was thinking of games like Suro, Camel Up, perhaps Love Letter, but I don't know if I would be stepping on toes since this is obviously library people who are hosting and running the event. If you have suggestions for how to broach the subject with them about demoing new games without sounding like a know-it-all. <laughs> and if I can convince them, what games would you suggest to run for a mixed group of people who likely have no concept of hobby games? Well, first off, I want to start by saying I wouldn't really call those games that Phil called hobby games. To me, those are educational games. Those are the kind of games you find at like Scholar's Choice, and I'm sure there's other educational toy stores out there. Um, to me, like I, I don't even like that doesn't even think Catan. Like you can get those. Those are those are mostly quick party games that people like to use in schools. Now, what Phil is describing here, I've got to say, is pretty common occurrence from what I've seen. Um, both locally, when somewhere new sets up a new game night, and I go out expecting all the local gamers to be there, and often a bunch of us local hobby gamers show up, and we're like, oh, okay, so you have Mario Yahtzee, and you've got Cards Against Humanity. Um, all right, then. <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's a common thing, and I see people complaining about this all the time, um, Board Game Geeks, uh, forums on Board Game Geek Facebook, the Dice Tower Facebook, pretty much anywhere where a bunch of hobby gamers have gathered. Someone has complained about going out to a local gaming event and not finding what they were hoping to find. It makes sense, though, because board games are all over the media right now, and probably for the last three years. And lots of people are hopping on the public play bandwagon. Now, this includes libraries, but also schools, clubs, organizations like the local legions, cafes, coffee shops. Everyone's like, oh, board games are popular. That's how we'll get more people in. Let's have a board game night. Now, all of these people launching these events have great intentions, but many, like the organizers of Phil's local event, don't really have a lot, if any, idea of how the board game industry and board gaming has changed over the years. And I'm totally with Phil here. It can be a shame and rather frustrating to show up to one of these events and just see, I'll, I'll say it, some terrible games, like mass market favorites and and like, like they expect Monopoly to be a good game, but it's a two hour game night. Like you just see a lot of disconnect from what these people expect the event to be and what they're offering to make that event what it is. Well, yes. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people aren't exposed to the other side of gaming. They go to Target, they go to Walmart, they go on Amazon and they see the mass market games. They may have never even figured out what that strange board and card game store over there is that the, the magic people go to. Uh, mm. They may have never walked in there and learned that there is this whole other world of board games out there. Uh, so that's why they should listen to our podcast at... <laughs> there you go. That's what we're here for. But now, unfortunately, there's a huge chunk of missing information here. I think getting that information is key to any and all steps that are going to follow for Phil. So who's running it and why are they running it? Yeah. So, so the first part of Phil's question, right? How do, how do I brute the subject, breach the subject without, without sounding like a, a know-it-all, right? I'm, I'm going to use the proper term here, but without, without being a dink about it, right? So the first thing you're going to want to do is find out who is running the event and you're going to want to approach them and offer to help and try to do it without offending anyone or, again, feeling coming off as superior or condescending. So first, you do need to know who's in charge. Now, 
Bill's particular case here, it sounds like it might be a group of people. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's one organizer, which I've got to say, unless there's a ton of people, I'm kind of surprised they have multiple people at a de library dedicated to this. But that might just show how much buy-in they actually have. So you're going to want to find out who's in charge. And you're going to want to talk to them. Now, my first tip here for Phil and anyone else who's in the same situation is don't do this in public. Don't call someone out at the event when there's lots of gamers standing around and lots of people playing games. You want to do this in private somehow. You don't want the person to feel embarrassed or pressured by you calling them out. You don't want this to be a call out. You want this to be a conversation about how can we improve this night. Now, the good thing is, it, since it's a library, there's probably a directory of staff. So if you can mm -hmm. find out who it is, you may be able to just email them and really keep mm -hmm. this in the background and not risk any sort of public thing. But check and then recheck your wording. So much nuance is lost in tech text you want to be offering help and guidance not in any way complaining about what they're doing because you you enjoy the fact that they're, yes. they are are running a board game night you're just concerned and or or interested in helping them uh, broaden their audience and uh, selection yeah personally this is one like yes i i get it a lot of us um are a little antisocial at times and i get wanting to email but this i really do think is a better conversation to have in person what I would probably do is go to the next gaming event and try to do it at the start, possibly show up a little early or at the end of the next gaming event, because added to that, you could have the stuff I'm going to suggest on hand. So if they do say yes, you could immediately act on it without, I'm sure people know where we're going, but if we're going to say, Hey, can you let me try out some new games with the group? And you have them with you. You could be like, you know what? I've got some games in the car. I could bring them in. What do you think? I just think it's going to go over better because the biggest problem is uh, it's Facebook, social media, Twitter is a perfect example of going and going, hey, I think I can bring better games than you have. And the person taking that as, what, you mean my games are garbage? And, and you don't want to get to that point. You don't want it to be adversarial or confrontational. Now, in this conversation, you're going to want to let them know who you are, right? Hey, I'm Phil Hatfield. I'm a longtime gamer. I've been into hobby games for years, blah, blah, blah. Just a bit of background. And I came out to your event and I had a good time, but I was just wondering if you'd be interested in doing some things a little bit differently because that dream night was great. I don't want you to change a thing, but I would like to add to it. So again, Sean mentioned this earlier, and I think it's, it's key is don't tell them their event is bad. Like you don't want to come off as your event sucks. I'm here to fix it. No, you're not here to fix it. You're here to make things better. Point out the advantages of making things better. The advantages of more modern games. There's some things people don't realize about modern hobby gaming that goes way beyond interesting new mechanics. Things like most modern games have a time limit that is pretty accurate. Now, I don't necessarily say go with what it says on the box because we all know that can be off, but Board Game Geek's a great place to find proper times. But if you're showing off games, you tend to know your time limits. You know how long games last. One of the biggest problems with a lot of mass market games is they don't have a definitive end or their end can get extended. You sit down to play a game of Monopoly and I'm probably going to pick on Monopoly a lot tonight, though that's not necessarily intentional. How long is that going to take? You don't know. It is very much based on the luck of the dice and how players play and whether you use the full rules or not. Yeah, Monopoly, Whereas, Monopoly especially being the one yeah. where just trying to get a group of people to agree on a rule set for Monopoly Yes. Uh, is probably a uh, quest on its own. Very true. So knowing that I can finish a game of Goku in 15 minutes, I can play a game of Chocolatiers in under an hour, and I can play a game a, a, a game of Castles of Burgundy in an hour and a half to two hours with longer players, you can better pick games that fit the game night and schedule them. Even a game of Yahtzee, you never know how long that's going to take because of the random rolls. Whereas most modern hobby games have very distinct time limits that are usually based on the number of people playing. You're probably not going to have a time, time to get even 4th edition Twilight Imperium, even though at the library. No, unlikely, unless it's some kind of marathon gaming night. But know that, right? You can find the information. You can find out that Twilight Imperium takes 6 to 16 hours or whatever it happens to be for the new edition. Other advantages are higher player counts. Most mass market games play a family of four. They're designed for your standard family of four. 
And you're kind of stuck with that without playing two copies. Yes, there are examples that go bigger than that. And while, yes, you can technically play Uno with 12, it's actually designed for four and actually does work a little better with lower player counts. So higher player counts are often available. You've got stuff like Sushi Go, which was actually already there, but that plays a high player count. There, there are lots of games that play tons of players, including throwing in like a werewolf or mafia that can play a group of any size. I personally think most modern games are more engaging than old school games because everyone is invested because of the strategy and tactics in them. So more people are going to be more engaged because you don't even care what you're doing. You care what your opponents are doing. When you're playing many mass market games, it's almost multiplayer solitaire. It's whoever can roll the farthest, whoever can get the furthest, whoever can get the hand of cards. I don't really care what you're doing on your turn. Just get back to my turn so I can roll the dice and move. Or you worse, don't get that as much. skip a turn, which is just... Yes unfortunate for everyone uh things like player agency actual control over the game where your decisions make a difference that is huge that is what draws most people to hobby board gaming keeps us all coming back for more and more the feeling that you did something you made a difference and then when you win there's an actual sense of accomplishment or the feeling that you built something or you went on a journey looking at various different types of games when you get to the end of a game of uh snakes and ladders what'd you do to win what was your winning strategy right it just doesn't exist and yes some that that's probably an extreme example but a lot of the mass market card game or board games and card games are like that i had the best shuffle in candy land ever that's exactly um educational a lot of these games are a lot more educational and cover topics that mass market games don't if you are a library and it happens to be Black History Month, bringing in a copy of Freedom, the Underground Railroad is an awesome way to provoke, prevent, uh, promote the month, to better get people talking about topics that are easily avoided, and to get gamers in. And like, it just, it, it's a win-win in a way, especially at a library. And that can expand to anything. There's, a, there's probably a board game for pretty much every historical period. But also, once you get into literature, there are Arthur card board games like Shadows Over Camelot. There are, <laughs> there's millions of topics. I'm not going to stop trying to call out specific ones off the top of my head, but you can probably tie your game night to the library way better with a hobby board game night than a mass market game night. Also, some of the mass market ones are terrible. <laughs> You might want to have a Winnie the Pooh board game night, seeing as he went into the public domain, you're not going to have much luck there. Yeah, I th although I have to say, I, I feel like I had a Winnie the Pooh board game growing up. I vaguely remember. I, there has to be a spinner based, probably Disney branded. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it was Disney's Pooh. I'm sure it wasn't yeah. uh, Milne's. But uh, yeah. So the other thing that having these games out is, is to me, they're better games, right? You're going to get people are going to come out, play these and want to discover more. So they're going to come back from them. You're also going to get different people coming out. When you have a public play event, you have games like Monopoly and Scrabble and Scategories, you are going to get casual gamers who like just want something fun to do for the evening. Whereas you start bringing out their tans and get up to levels like Power Grid, you're going to start getting hobby gamers out that are there to play the games, not just to socialize. So you're actually attracting a different audience. And you're also bringing in people who are passionate about games. So you don't just have a bunch of people sitting around. You have people in there who are engaged, energized, and having fun, which is just going to make the game and the events more interesting for everyone else there, right? It's just the energy in the room. If you walk into a, a room where a bunch of people are playing Euchre, like a Euchre tournament, versus you walk into a hobby game night that with Pack, like one of our Extra Life events, the vibe is very different. You do want to be careful, though. And again, this goes to not trying to uh, overwhelm them or, or indicate that they're bad. There is a reason to have market, mass market games yes. there. Uh, mm -hmm. Having mass market games there allows the people who aren't hobby gamers to feel a level of comfort when they walk mm. in. Someone who's not a, a, a gamer, a hobby gamer, uh, can walk into a room and see people playing Catan or you know Galaxy Trucker or uh, you know any of this these these strange games and get overwhelmed easily. Mm -hmm. But if they see a box of Monopoly sitting there, even if it's not being played, seeing some games that they know and understand and are mm -hmm. familiar with can really comfort them. And maybe they'll sit down and play some, some categories 
and then you can someone can talk them into another game. Hey, you want to come join us over at this game here? You know, you want to come play Go Cuckoo? Sure. Yep. Uh, and 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 ease them into the other scary games that they aren't <laughs> used to. Yeah, and this kind of goes with what I said earlier about how you want to build on the existing event. You don't want to replace. You're not here to fix. Mass market games are mass market games and sold in the biggest stores in the world for a reason. They are popular. People do enjoy them, and I'm not saying they're terrible. Except maybe Monopoly. I might be saying that just a bit. Terrible for a public play event either way. You don't you don't want to rip off the person you've never met before in a bad deal and have them lose and be mad at you when you don't even know them. Not a game you want to play in public for many reasons. But overall, yes, have the mass market fair. Always have decks of cards. That is probably my number one. Have decks of cards. There are so many different games you can play with decks of cards. Now, maybe as the hobby gamer, you might want to show people some interesting new ways to play with decks of cards. But have decks of cards. Decks of cards are fantastic. Have roll and moves. Have have sorry, trouble, um, snakes and ladders for younger kids. Though I can't see any adults playing it. Have those kind of games people are used to because it's going to make them comfortable. And even then, don't pressure people to try the new ones. If they're happy playing that, let them be happy playing that. Yep, absolutely. Now, another thing to suggest for Phil is to make sure that you can show how you can help. Like, not just, hey, your game night sucks, fix it, right? That's not what you want to do. And I already say you don't want to say your game night sucks. But even like, you know what would be great if you had some more hobby games? I think that would make the game more entertaining for everyone. Thank you. I really hope you have some next week, right? That doesn't help. You want to be able to show how you can help. For one, and I think most hobby gamers can pull this one off, you know what, next week, next time, next month, let me bring in some games that I think your group will enjoy. Stuff that's just a little more complicated than what you have here that I think is more engaging. Stuff that'll keep players more interested. Or let me show, blow your mind by bringing in this game that's like reverse pickup sticks that you have no idea how engaging it can be until you play it, right? Offer to do that. Be sure to offer to teach these games. Um, tell them what you can do for them, right? Like, please use my skills. I am here to try to make your event better. What can I do to help? That's an important question to ask. They put the suggestion out there, but also ask, what can I do to help? Absolutely. And the other option is there are other games out there that are technically mass market, but more gamer games. You can get mm -hmm. into variations of Parcheesi or Nine Men's Morris mm -hmm. and, and other games that, hey, you know what? This game is actually just like Sorry, but you know yes. this has been around for ages. There's a, there's a bunch of different ways to uh, to sort of broach things and 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 sh again shift people, uh, ease them into the bigger world of games. So what I would suggest too is starting small, like keep the format right. Whatever format they have set up, don't change it for next month, right? Whatever that happens to be, whether it's everyone shows up and they sign in and there's a list of games to play, whatever whatever that happens to be, stick to what they have and then, again, build on it. You don't want to necessarily change it. If it changes over time, sure, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. But don't go in expecting to fix everything. Maybe bring in one new game, right? Like a, a well-known gateway game, like stuff that people may have heard of, like Catan's all over the news. I think pretty much everyone's heard of Ticket to Ride. Something approachable, but still a step above what most people grew up with. Offer to teach it during the show if enough people get interested. Or maybe go with something flashy, right? So it's simple and simple to learn that is totally going to blow people's minds. A great game for that for me is Ice Cool. You now have a game about flicking penguins or bring in a copy of Crokinole or Pitch Car, something that's just so different from what people are expecting when they show up to play a board game night. They think a board game means roll dice and move on a track. That's what most people think. And as going to com comic cons and trying to show off hobby board games, it still seems like the majority of people think that it's either trivia, a party game where you have to draw or guess something, or you roll and move dice, roll and move upon. That's what most people have in their heads. When they show up and see a race car track where you're flicking little wooden discs, it just kind of blows their minds. Absolutely. And there's so many options out there that, you know, even just uh, a simple game um, like uh, DC Legends or D uh, Legends of Marvel Legends or DC Heroes, you know, games that are board games, but completely break that uh, mold that people have in their minds of mm -hmm. roll and move around the square. Now, another thing I would do to help show that you were adding value to their night is 
offer to promote the event to other hobby gamers, right? Because if you have these kind of games, so right, right, if you add some more strategic games, I know I can get the the people who hang out at Hugan and Muna, our local game store. They they have an open game night on Wednesday. I bet you I can get half those people to come out here on a Friday, just because I know they're into these kind of games and they're always looking for new places to play their games. Be able to sell the fact that you're going to help them grow their event, not just with different games, but with different people. Now, do, however, be careful with promotion. It's easy to unbalance supply and demand. You don't want to suddenly get all of the hobby gamers from the local game store piling in one night when you're just bringing in maybe a couple of your games to get things started. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets bored and no one comes back. Yeah, very true. Uh, this goes to something else. Like it, this is more running a game night, public play game night, which I didn't really get into a, a lot. I don't really want to get into a lot tonight, but you don't want to scare people away. And again, don't force people. Uh, this is one of the things. There's an awesome interview with the owner of Snakes and Lattes, who said when they first opened the store, it was hobby games and like the Monopoly Sorry Go shelf. Now it's Monopoly, sorry, go and hobby games because that's what people want when they come to the store. And when you're running a business, you have to give people what they want. Said 90% of the people who walk in didn't plan to sit down and play games and think all night. They were happened to be wandering by or like, oh, let's go play a couple board games, have a coffee and a snack. And those kind of games are where your mass market games fall in. And you don't want to try to pressure people. Now, what you do say is maybe have a section say, if you like this, you might like this or something like that you might want to have. But in general, you don't want to pressure anyone or to make them feel insignificant, stupid or inferior for liking different types of games. Games are games. It's a hobby. It's meant to be something fun. If that's what they find fun, all the power to them. And it may be just a matter of you bring in a game you want to play. And maybe a couple of people get interested and you play your fun ga a hobby game together and people are interested. Uh, yeah. And maybe next week you bring a different game and they ask, well, what about that other game you had last week? I saw you guys playing that and it looked fun. Mm -hmm. Can you bring that again next week? That may be all it takes. Uh, of course, you do want to make sure that you are able to bring games in. They, don't, yeah. they, may, uh, <laughs> they may have rules about that. But if you are and if they're okay with you bringing your own games in, it may just be a matter of, January, you bring in fun game, you know, careful Mars to, to play and, and, and play with people. And a couple of people see you, watch you and ask questions as you're playing with one or two other people that were interested enough to sit down with you. And then the next month, and, you know, you bring another game and people start asking and that just slowly builds interest mm -hmm. or it doesn't. And that's fine too. But yes. it's the, definitely the easier way to sort of slow grow uh, people and, and feel out people's interest in the hobby yeah to me that's that's the easier way to do it to me it's a bit of a passive aggressive way though kind of like just show up with new games You're like i don't like what you have so i'm bringing my own games i'm gonna set them up and start asking people <laughs> to play like personally i think you should still talk to the organizers and make sure it's okay like sean said ask if you can bring games but depending on your personality type and what the you know phil's been to the event he knows the vibe of the place you might be able to judge from that vibe that, you know what, maybe these people aren't that approachable and this is one way to do it. Like I said, a little more passive aggressively, like, hey, I don't like the games you have, so I'm going to bring my own in. One of the things I do suggest, though, is if you are going to do this, bring in another hobby gamer with you, whether that's one or two people, and play these games with them. This way you can sit down and start playing and other people can see you enjoying the game, right? And anytime we have done this at a public play event that tends to have... Um, non-gamers present right especially if we play in a public space where we're like in a corner but the rest of the place is still doing its own thing we always get people come over and go what are you playing what's that and yes they're gonna say is it like monopoly because that's what they say because that's what they know and they're looking for a basis of comparison you want to do that so that then when people do wander over you're like oh no this is this and you know we're about done we're gonna start another round do you want to play and that's where i recommend you bring a couple people like like leave room for people to join so I probably wouldn't start with Terraforming Mars and, and that might be a March game to me. That That's a bit overwhelming with all the cards on the table and the hexes. There's just so much going on. But if you do bring in, say, a Ticket to Ride or a Catan or a Gizmos or something kind of next step level games, start a two-player game of Gizmos. And when that ball marble drop starts happening and people come over, 
say, hey, you want to join in? You know what? We just started. It's easy for us to restart. What you don't want to do, and I've actually seen this at local play events, and I had to ask the person doing it, is why are you showing up? Is don't show up with six people with a six-player game and set it up in a corner and play your six-player game and don't interact with anyone else and leave. Like, to me, I've never understood. I'm like, why don't you just play at home? Now, I will admit, with that group, no one had a home with the table big enough. So they were coming out to the public play event to use the table. But personally, at a public play event, I want to encourage people interacting. So I wouldn't be that person to take up a corner and just do my own thing. What you would want to do is to try to, again, you're trying to improve the event for everyone, not just for you. Now, when picking games, you might want to also catch people's attention right away. So what I try to do, and this is what I did at our easy mode events, which was a new venue that got in a very different type of person than our local game store did. Most of the people coming in there were video gamers who were curious about board games. So what I would do is get the games set up. And what I would do here is I would actually try to do it before people show up. So again, if you've talked to the, the organizer, say, hey, can I show up 10 minutes early, five minutes early to get some games set up? You want them games set up on the table, ready to play and looking interesting. With that, maybe have a little placard or something that says, this is uh, Dead Man's Cabal a game about necromancers trying to form a dance party. And then maybe have another sign that says, if you like Catan, come check out um, Chinatown, a great game about trading resources or something like that to get people interested. Now, the disadvantage of having multiple games set up is you might need to teach multiple games, but it's a way to get people interested. Plus, by having these signs out, it makes them approachable. People aren't like, oh, that's a display. Or, oh, that's Phil's game. He's sitting in the corner and he's going to play with Phil's friends. By doing this, it's inviting people to check out the games and try them. Absolutely. Now, one of the things you might want to do, uh, this is specific to Phil, but anyone else in the situation is actually offered to take over. Now, game nights are a lot of work, but can be so worth it. Now, this of all options is the most pretentious, right? Like, you're only going to do this if the person running the event doesn't look like they want to be running the event. Or you can tell they're struggling, they're not having fun. Perhaps the library was like, hey, Bob, you're running our monthly board game night now. And Bob's like, what, well, board games? I don't play board games. You could volunteer to take over Bob's place. But don't do it in a, hey, Bob, you're doing a terrible job at this. I think I could do better, right? Again, you got to be tactful about this. Absolutely. You need, and you do need to be careful, uh, more than likely, since it is at a library, regardless of who's running it, there has to be a library person in charge just to be right. able to use the space. So there are, there are definitely uh, liability and insurance aspects to that as well. All right, um, I'll just jump ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so there again, uh, well, you covered a lot of this, so, so I don't want to I, okay. sort of I, I double, double down on things. So one, one, way of, one way you can definitely do this, though, is if the person is interested in running the game, maybe Bob really does like board games, build them some board games that they seem to not be aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they only know Monopoly and Scattergories and, and Sushi Go. Uh, and maybe if you introduce them, maybe, you know, talk to Bob and go out for coffee one night and invite him somewhere else to play board games and introduce him to Catan or something like that. And they'll be hooked and they'll be the ones who are trying to introduce that stuff to there. Uh, it, it's certainly, you know, don't necessarily make it about that game night, make it about introducing Bob or whomever to these new games uh, and mm -hmm. let them introduce them to the game night. So that's what I've got for, for tips for at least breaching the subject and how you can approach it, what you can offer. And again, the, the, the key point here is you're not there to fix anything. It's not necessarily broken. You are just looking to add to an existing night to make it appeal to more people like yourselves. So approach it that way, right? Approach it as trying to improve something that exists to make it better for everyone. Absolutely. Now, as for the second part of this, Phil's part of it was what are some great games to bring to such events? So this is something we've definitely covered before. So what I want to do is give you a little list of stuff, places you can go with it in our content to learn about this, because this is not the first time this type of questions come up, though in this particular aspect of a, a public play event without 
with games that Phil didn't like is definitely new. But as for talking about gateway games, games to hook gamers and so on, we've already got a lot of content out there. So episode 28 going way back was called The Hook. That was games for catching new gamers. And every game on that list, I went through it today just to confirm, I still recommend. We talked about next step games from Catan in episode 42, Life, the Universe, and More Than Catan. So if you have Catan friends, fans and they know it, what I did is break it down into the different things about Catan people could like, like rolling for resources or trading. And I talk about once. We even specifically talked about follow-up games to Ticket to Ride. So if, again, you know, the group there has played Ticket to Ride, we covered that on Working on the Railroad, which was episode 132. Um, episode 54 was the last time we totally revisited Gateway Games. We called Gateway Games the Next Generation, where I recommended a bunch of games that were currently in print and had been printed in the last three years, back when that episode came out. Due to the age of all that, though, I did think it'd be worth revisiting it tonight with a new list that includes some more modern games that are on those older lists. Which is shocking for us, I know, but we'll <laughs> get to some new stuff. So first off, I'm going to start with the ones Phil mentioned, because I think they're legit. I think they're really solid. So this isn't going to help Phil out at all, but for those of the rest of you out there, Phil mentioned Camel Up. Camel Up. Uh, this is a great betting game that looks like a racing game. Now, the mechanics are simple enough that you're going to be able to teach pretty much everyone. I know kids that play this game. It's really simple. Take an action. You can do this, or you can do this, or you can move the camels. That's it. Now, where this is going to blow away most non-gamers' minds is the fact that you don't have a player piece. That is a difficult concept for some non-gamers. <laughs> you don't own any of the camels. The camels are going to race around the track on their own, but I rolled dice to move the camel. Yes, you can choose to move one of the camels, and it will move, but that's not your camel. What you do control is you are betting on those camels. What camel do you think is going to come in first? What camel do you think is going to come in last? As well as making bets on who's going to be ahead each round. This is a great choice for a game that is both going to be familiar. It's a race. It's a bunch of camels going around an oval. And has new concepts that players probably aren't used to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Camel Up is uh, is is right out up there with uh introductory games now Sturro, i'm not a huge fan i actually talked about this earlier in the podcast tonight but this can be a fantastic game for new gamers this teaches the absolute basics of tiling every tile in Sturro fits with every other tile in Sturro. you don't have to worry about matching sides they all match what you got to watch is where the um paths go I, the whole idea of having three tiles in your hand and playing one and drawing new tiles is a mechanic used in many other hobby board games. So this is a great step. If you have a non-hobby gamer and you're thinking of teaching him Carcassonne, often considered a great gateway game, you might want to just start with Suro to get the basics of putting tiles out and that infecting the board every turn. Suro also plays a huge number of players, which can be great for getting people to interact with other people they may not know in person, at least not yet. Absolutely. And that is part of this. Again, we want more people interested in these games if you want them to continue trying out these new strange games. And uh, interaction is the key to that. Now, Love Letter is the last one he mentioned. Now, this is one I personally don't love, but it has proven to be hugely popular with gaming groups of all ages and experience levels. The key here, though, as far as I can tell, is having someone who knows the game well at the table to teach it and then to monitor it. While I can set up Soro and teach it in five minutes, you place a tile, this happens, and then just walk away, you're going to want to sit and watch the first early games of Love Letter to make sure everyone has the rules down. Especially for a non-gamer, the concept of having drawing one card and then discarding and being able to peek at other people's cards and not talk about it. For an 18-card game, there's actually a lot of little intricacies that most people take for granted. As a hobby gamer, you're like, yeah, it's a social deduction game. I get it. But if you've never played these kind of games, what I would start off with is go, this is somewhat like Clue, because Clue is probably the one mass market deduction game people know of. Absolutely. And the one thing you need to really pay attention to here is that you're going to be the one who's almost certainly teaching anything mm -hmm. you bring and not just once. So be prepared on that front. If you're bringing multiple games, uh, if you're deep in the middle of for the queen, 
uh, and someone wants to play Suro who's never played it before, and the other people have only played it once and aren't sure, they're you're gonna they're gonna need you as the teacher, as the mm-hmm. person who brought those games to get in there and help. And we've talked uh, we've talked before on other episodes about how organizers don't always get to play. Yeah, what I would recommend here is in Phil's case, I know Phil wants to play. So Phil's best bet is to offer to demo the game Phil wants to play. And that is the only game Phil will be demoing. And the organizers are in charge of everything else going around around them is probably your best bet. Because when you're only, they only scheduled, right? They had an event in December. They only have three more scheduled. That's not a lot of time to do it. So unless Phil's like wants to throw out one of those months just to teach people various hobby games. So I still say the secret here is get other hobby gamers out because hobby gamers love to share their hobby. And no, not everyone can teach, but everyone loves to introduce new people to their favorite game. Yep, absolutely. Well, now on to some games we suggest for getting people at a public play event playing more complicated games. All right, as usual, this list is in no particular order other than these are the order they kind of came into my brain when I was writing on the show notes. The number one game I have, I shouldn't even call it number one, the first game I have is Funfair. This is a card-driven game where you're building a theme park. Now, most people are going to be familiar with card games in general, right? Shuffling, having a hand of cards, drawing cards, and playing cards are pretty common concepts. What you do have to watch for here is getting across the importance of building an engine. The thing is, Funfair is fantastic for it because of how well your engine building ties to the theme. You are going to build a roller coaster. You're going to add a loop-de-loop to it. You're going to add a big drop to it. And you're going to add comfortable seats. And you're going to have a washroom in the line. That all makes sense to the average person who's been to a theme park before. Oh, you're going to add a greeter at the door? That gets you more money. Oh, you've got someone who's cosplaying the costume character? That's going to get you more money. Because of how well the theme is tied to the game, I think Funfair is a fantastic starter engine builder card game. Absolutely. It is a great game for introducing hobby games and hobby card games as both cards and theme parks are pretty universal concepts. And that just helps this game get learned that much faster. Now, the next one is a game on our list. We used to talk about it felt like on a daily basis, even though we are a weekly show, and that is Azul. Uh, In this particular case, I am talking about the original game, the base game. This is a now classic abstract strategy game all about drafting beautiful looking tiles and placing them onto your player board to match an existing pattern. Now, scoring in Azul is the one stumbling point I can see with new gamers, and I've actually had that problem with hobby gamers. If anyone at the table has played Scrabble, though, they should pick up on it right away because the scoring system is actually very similar, except for the bonus point. Now, the other versions of Azul are also worth considering. But personally, I think the basic game is the most approachable of the three Azul games. Yeah, I I definitely agree. Stick with the basic and maybe have some scoring examples even printed out. Mm. Just to help reference, to have someone look for. I know they're there on the bottom of the board, but those are not as clear as they Mm. could be. Next, I have the silliest game on the list, which is Go Cuckoo a game from Haba released for Easter. This is, yes, this is a kid's game. This is meant for small children, but this is a great game to show off to adults that not all board games have to involve a board and rolling dice or trivia. This is a game all about pulling out um, sticks and building a bird nest and then trying to place eggs into that nest so they balance. This game has great table presence, which is going to get people going, what are you doing? I have never set up a game of Go Cuckoo that didn't turn heads unless everyone in the room had seen the game played before. And almost everyone who walks over is like, can I play this next? It is such a great game. It is a fantastic kids game that I have had so much fun with, with players of all ages. Absolutely. This one is a great one to slip in based on games they're already playing. They won't even realize they moved to something that's more advanced as they're just having so much fun. We have even set this up in a back corner behind a streaming table on a chair for two of us to play quietly and still manage to get other people jumping in to play the game. 
Uh, thanks for the follow, new new one thousand, and we will be getting to the comments. Our chat room is is slowly filling in with game recommendations. We'll get to those shortly after we finish off our list, which we don't have much left. Next up, I've got King Domino. Now, most people uh, dominoes, at least when I was growing up, I, I actually wonder if it's as prevalent as it used to be. But the concept of dominoes matching the edges of tiles to build a pattern is pretty ubiquitous. Now, King Domino starts with that, but then it tosses in a really interesting drafting mechanic on who gets to place which domino. And it is actually really brilliant. The, the turn system in King Domino is one of my favorites. And then you have a unique scoring system that's a little different that actually makes it an area control game. But those two combines are built on such a basic concept that I think this is a great gateway game. Now, one of the things that will happen is your first game, someone's probably going to be a little lost and score badly, but they're going to pick it up right away. And with how quick this game is, it's really easy to play two or three games in a row. Now, one of the things I do love about King Domino is that once you get people hooked on it, you can easily start adding in the expansion, specifically Queen Domino, which adds a lot more hobby game elements, like having an economy where you have to start earning money to buy for buildings and buildings that you can build into your empire and a little bit of engine building and even some take that with being able to send a dragon against someone else. To me, that is a perfect step into bigger, meatier Euro games just by taking your basic King Domino and adding in the Queen Domino elements. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, King Domino is probably the absolute easiest one on this list to teach people. The game just makes sense. I mean, dominoes are one of those basic things that we learn as, as infants almost. Next, I have the most modern game on the list, something I couldn't have talked about in any previous episodes because it was just released this year, and that is Land vs. Sea from Good Games Publishing. Uh, for a full review, you can check out our last episode. We just reviewed this one. This is one of the easiest to learn tile laying games out there, taking under five minutes to teach. No, it's not quite so simple, but I would say it's even easier to teach than Carcassonne. Now that's just the basic game. It is a really dead simple place a tile, place another tile, try to complete areas. If you're land, you're trying to complete land. If you're sea, you're trying to complete sea. That's basically it. There are optional scoring rules you can also add that make the game more complex. Now, the problem is, what I think is the gateway game is the basic game, the one that you could probably teach anyone. Any non-gamer is going to be able to pick up the basic game. The game only plays two players the basic game. But once you get enough people who have played that, you can then group those people together and play in groups of three and four. I think this could be a great one to grow with your group as well, because you can slowly introduce those new rules, which include more hobby gaming concepts. Absolutely. I, I would uh, consider Land vs. Sea the next one up from King Domino. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still easy to teach, but you've got more complex shapes and you're developing more complex patterns Perfect. than King Domino. Yeah, one of the hard ones on Land vs. Sea is to get people to not pay attention to the, the clutter on the tiles. And at least in the basic game, you can just be like, ignore it all, yep. except for these two symbols. Just Once you start throwing in the extra scoring, then it gets a little more difficult. One of the things that I think is great for public play events is thematic games, things that people are going to recognize based on properties they enjoy. So my next suggestion is Horrified Universal Monster. That theme alone, these are the classic black and white movie monsters of yore. That is going to catch people's attention. Now, what I love most about this game is how simple the actual rules are once you start playing. They're going to seem overwhelming to a, a new player because there's four different things I can do on my turn. How do I choose? But once you start playing, it all just makes sense. And I personally think for a new group of gamers, you're going to play with one monster. I don't even know if the rules say you can play with one monster. I know you can go down to two. Play with one monster. Sure, it's going to be dead, simple, and easy to win. But that's perfect when trying to hook people and for people just learning how to play more complicated games than they're used to. I'm sure your group will be up to three, four, maybe even five monsters in no time. Yeah, absolutely. This is probably the most advanced of the games on this list, but honestly, that's not saying much. No. Uh, it shares a lot of concepts with mass market games, and the topics and content are familiar to most folks, yes. uh, much more so than train routes or European cities. I agree. Finally, I have the most oddball game on the list, in my opinion. Quacks of Quedlinburg. Now, despite the 
fact that Quacks is very much a designer board game. Wolfgang Warch. It's it it's in the hobby realm for sure. You're not going to find this one at Target. I find it's very approachable to new players as long as you teach it, making sure to tie the mechanics to the theme. Don't tell people, oh, there's a catch-up mechanic where you add rat tails. That means nothing to a new gamer. Tell them the players who are behind start to cheat by tossing in rat tails to thicken the broad. And they can get away with this because everyone's paying attention to the point leaders. That is going to get people like, oh, I get it. I'm be- I, you're busy looking at Sean who's got all the points. I'm going to slip in some rat tails and cheat, which rat tails make the game easier to win. It is a catch-up mechanic, but you don't have to describe it that way. The push your luck and real-time elements of this game make it highly engaging. And I've got to admit, even not playing this game or you've already done for the round, watching other people agonize over whether they should pull more ingredients out of their bag or not is a ton of fun to watch. I have sat and watched people playing this game, no intention of trying it myself and had a great time. Now, the one thing you do have to worry about here specifically because Phil's talking about a library game night is this can get loud. This can get very loud. And while most libraries want you to keep things relatively quiet, Absolutely. You can promise to be quiet, but when you pull that snap berry and your pot bursts and suddenly you get a little loud, even yes. if it's just for a moment. So with these games, the, the, the three games Phil mentioned, the seven I just mentioned, that gets us to seven suggestions total, which I think is good for now. Because as I mentioned before, the concept of gateway games and games to hook gamers is a recurring topic on the show as it has been. So what I will do is I will provide links to not only where you can purchase these games, but I will also include links to all those previous shows and maybe some of our blog articles as well if you are looking for a more comprehensive list. All right, well, now let's uh, head over to the lobby and see what games the lobbyists love. No, let's let's see what suggestions the lobbyists had for this topic. All right, lobbyists, what game suggestions do you have for Phil? And we've got some great uh, chat happening in there already. Thanks for joining Impacts, even if you can't stay long. Uh, Flashy is uh, the great, uh, you know, the first thing Pax has to say. Uh, something with great table presence, uh, Colt Express and Camel Up, which we already talked about. Yes, Camel are their Up, we definitely talked about. Uh, for making people go, what's that? Yeah, Cult Express is a, a programmed movement game where you're robbing a train that comes with a literal 3D train you are moving your playing pieces over. Um, I would think the new Fireball Island would probably be a fantastic game for this. Or the new Hero Quest, recently republished by Avalon Hill. Though those might be considered mass market, at least they were back in the day, they're definitely more on the hobby game side of things now. Um, something else I would recommend is pulling in licenses. If you know that people um, at the event are into certain licenses, you may want to try to find games of those licenses. Sean mentioned DC, Marvel. Those are two big ones. Uh, the Funkoverse games are use the you know silly looking Funko figures to do little bit battle games. We blew people's minds with that game at a Comic Con. Like they had no clue. Like uh, it's a game where you set up your figures and you're going to battle. Like there's different ways to play. You can play Capture the Flag or whatever. We were just doing a, a you know a, a what do you got? Just a beat em up, right? Last man standing. And we put it on the table. And the first thing the players always wanted to do was grab the dice to roll because that's how every game they play. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You have, you have four action points. What do you want to do? Well, what are the dice for? Well, if you try to hit them, it's to see if you hit. And like for people who haven't been playing hobby games for years or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, that just blew their minds. Fair enough. Uh, the next thing Pax has is uh, another thing that many games people grew up with didn't have strong themes yeah now this isn't quite as uh true now with uh, some of the heavy theming of even monopoly that's getting out oh, there yes but uh it's you know what mo said about dead man's cabal it's intrigue with a theme or yes. we're space for space starers exploring new worlds or nomads in a post-apocalyptic world uh themes unlike you know rank boring monopoly no one really gets monopoly i mean yes everyone sort of understands that you're playing like a daddy warbucks kind of character but it doesn't feel immersive at all whereas modern board games definitely do no i totally agree theme is a great way to sell games that that especially to public people who don't know 
let's put it this way. If you don't know hobby board gaming, you're going to walk in and go, well, I don't know, that game's got a bunch of hexes on it. That's got this rid of stuff all over the place. There's some people stacking wooden sticks on a can. Like, like what is going on? Meanwhile, if they look over and go, oh, wait, that's Star Trek. That's definitely the Enterprise. That's a Klingon ship. What's this? And here I am teaching Star Trek Expeditions, a cooperative Star Trek game. Well, not a gateway game. The Star Trek theme is going to give people a lot of leeway and willingness to try a game that actually is a fairly complicated Rainier Nitzia game. But they wouldn't have touched it if it wasn't for that Star Trek theme. Absolutely. Uh, next up, she recommends Indigo, a nice alternative yes. to Suro. Honestly, yes. Yep. So that's, I, 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 I am not a Soro fan. I love Indigo. Oh, the yeah. only advantage Soro has over Indigo is I can set it up and walk away because it's that simple. And it plays like eight players, I think. It's a lot. It, it's eight or ten. Whereas Indigo is limited to four players only. Indigo is fantastic. It uses hexes to build your path. And you're trying to get gems to come off the board. But like you only score you and who's like you have two gates you score on. And whenever you score, it goes to two people. So it's like you're trying to help someone without helping yourself. Indigo is fantastic. I strongly recommend Indigo. If you're a Suro fan, go get Indigo if you ever play with less than eight people. There we go. And uh, New New uh, 1000, our, our new uh, lobbyist, recommends Crane, Fractured Empire. Now, this is a new one, just kickstarted this year. I think it yeah, only got into say, people's hands uh, in October of this year. Uh, or or thereabouts. Uh, I think it's really only available on uh, crunchygames.com. That's crunchy with a K. Uh, it's a self-published game, but it's a intricate, uh, it's a fantasy fantasy card game, deck builder sort, uh, but they really spent a lot of money on the art and theme of mm -hmm. the game. Uh, and it, uh, it isn't heavily reviewed in Board Game Geek, but the people who have reviewed it are definitely into it. Nice. Yeah, there's some uh, well, beginner deck builders. There's a few out there, like Dominion. Dominion is the gateway to deck building for people who've never played a deck builder before. Yeah. It is great for showing off how that system works. Now, most hobby gamers are probably sick to heck of Dominion and would rather sit down and play Clank or something a little more advanced or Lost Ruins Arnak, which I'll be talking about a bit later. Dominion still stands as a, hey, check out this new concept. And I mean, they do have games like Sushi Go there. So yeah. something like Donuts for Donuts, right. um, or even just playing something as simple as Haggis. Um, you know, again, these card games are so easy and quick and fun to play and easy to teach. And again, cards are familiar. Everyone yes. sat down and played a card game of some sort. So it's an easy one to get uh, get people involved. Yeah, with. I almost I almost put diamonds on my list, but I put it on like every other one of those post where i was trying to pick different games for this one so we're not just repeating ourselves diamonds is to cards like spades or hearts or clubs right it's no one had put out a diamonds game so someone sat down and decided to make a game with diamonds that actually plays up to six players so you don't get a lot of trick taking games with six players and it has a whole thing where there's these diamonds passing around and it's the person with the most diamonds who wins so diamonds is a strong recommendation because it plays with standard cards um one of the things we did not talk about at all is role-playing games you mentioned For the Queen in passing, but I think For the Queen is a fantastic game to have in an event like this. Something that's past the stick improv role playing with some structure added to it. So it's not just free form. Rory Story Cubes is more of a free form one that I think would also be great. And something like Dungeon Dragons Adventure Begins, though I didn't give that rave reviews, it's pure improv, just make stuff up aspect is great for non gamers who don't need the structured rules where you just Roll a d20 to see what happens, even though whatever you describe doesn't matter. But getting people into that interaction and storytelling is fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, and then Mountain Papa mentioned Space Base, one of our uh, recent favorites. That's a little you know tough what? one to introduce people to. It was, it was on my list at first, and I took it off because even hobby gamers have difficulty with the way charge cubes work and what some of those powers mean. What I would be really tempted to do is to make a public play copy of Space Base, where I hand a demo pick, version, yeah, yeah, like I hand pick which cards can come out into the market and remove some of the more complicated ones that are like get five charge cubes and swap swap your six with your seven, and also get two bucks and activate your card to the left, right? Like just take all those out, take out the you win card, take out the penalizes other player cards, and just keep in the basic. You get income, you get um 
whatever the three rules are. You get income, you get credits, or you get points. I mean, even the idea of income reset, you know, your 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 credits resetting every time back to your income is, you know, there's some tough concepts in there for people who are used to Monopoly. Yes. It's, it's close. Base base is definitely, that, that's a, again, they're going to have an event in January, February, and March, maybe in March, after you've already brought a few hobby games out, you can slip that out. I think it's a great game. It's a great public play game. It's a great, with all the expansions, seven players, great high player count, keeps everyone engaged. But when I think new gamers, I literally think, again, people are used to roll and move, trivia, party games, drawing things like that. That's kind of the mindset of, and cards, like play, playing cards. There we go. All right, well, that's what we've got uh, from our lobby right now. But remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to a detailed review of the 2021 printing of Galaxy Trucker, including a comparison to the original. First off, I want to start by thanking CGE for sending us a review copy of this new printing of Galaxy Trucker to check out. The well, Galaxy Trucker was designed by Vlada Shavadal and was originally published in 2007 by Czech Games Edition or CGE. Now, this new edition is still by Vlada with some rule tweaks and features one of the original artists, Thomas Kaverchi. I apologize if I got that pronounced wrong. This was also published by CGE in 2021 features a much lower MSRP of only $29.95 US. Now, this edition of Galaxy Trucker plays two to four players, with games taking under half an hour for a standard game. Now, note the game also features a longer optional play mode called the Transgalactic Trek, which takes much longer as it's basically playing the game three times in a row. So while many people may already be familiar and looking for the differences, what is Galaxy Trucker for those not aware? In Galaxy Trucker, you are playing space truckers working for Corporation Incorporated, delivering much needed sanitary pipes across the stars. Over the years, Corp Inc. determined the cheapest way to do this was to have the truckers fly ships actually built out of sanitary pipes, the pipes they're meant to deliver. Now, the game is played over three rounds. With the first round, players build ships out of tiles in real time adding things like modular housing units, hot water heaters, engines, plasma drills, and power centers, and more, while following some strict but easy-to-learn placement rules. Next, everyone goes through pre-launch, where they collect crew, energy tokens, etc. to fill their ship. Once everyone has their ships built, they then go on a supply run, where players encounter all kinds of interesting things, like fun meteor showers, very welcoming pirates, abandoned perfectly safe space stations, totally uninhabited non-dangerous planets, and while there's that combat zone thing and a few other things you'll encounter along the way. Once at your destination, players are awarded credits, points, for things like the order you arrived, the delivery of cargo, and for having the most intact ship at the end of the journey. For a look at what you get in the box for this new edition of Galaxy Trucker, Check out our unboxing video on YouTube. So this game comes with a fantastic rule book that is great for learning the game that is actually designed to read at the table the first time you play for playing through your learning game. Now, the components here will be familiar for fans of the game, though everything's been tweaked just a bit. Uh, there's new center boards. There's three ship boards, plastic cargo cubes, a tweaked adventure card deck featuring new graphic design, and a ton of thick, well-cut cardboard ship tiles, notably more than in the original game. Now, one notable new component you'll recognize are title tiles. These are something I'll be getting into in a bit. So not a huge change, but a general upgrade then. Now, one of the new things that's included in this edition of Galaxy Trucker is a four-page quick reference guide that I think is a fantastic addition to the box. This includes a full rule summary, as well as describing every tile type and how the adventure cards works. This is the most welcome addition, in my opinion. Overall component quality is fantastic, though I will say I wish the energy cubes were a little bigger. They are the same as in the original game. They're little tiny. We like to call them Tic Tacs. They tend to roll a little bit. I just wish they were a little larger. They are the, the most fiddly component in the game. 
Okay, so we've got the box open and checked everything out. How about you walk us through an overview of play for Galaxy Trucker? Okay, so first off, this is going to be very much an overview. There's a lot of different tiles in Galaxy Trucker and a lot of different cards, and I am not going to take the time to describe every little bit. Now, one of the biggest changes you're going to notice right away is the default way to play the game has changed. After finishing the learning flight, the tutorial flight, each time you sit down to play Galaxy Trucker, you're going to choose what level you want to play, one, two, or three. Now, is that a difficulty level then, or is it length of play? So it's a difficulty level, a complexity level, and a length of play. So level one ship has less room on it, so there's less to build, so it's going to be quicker. The adventure cards are simpler and easier to beat, and you're going to use less of them. And the, I'm um, trying to think of how to word this, sorry. Mo just has a brain fart in the middle of review because I didn't put answers to Sean's question. Sorry. <clears throat> All right. I so it's a little bit of part. everything. It covers it covers difficulty and length. Yeah. So yes, it's difficulty and length because with the three different levels, you have different ship sizes, you have different adventure cards you're going to use, and also the number of adventure cards. So your actual length of your journey, how many encounters you have, is going to change. So one is a simpler, quicker game, and three is the more complicated, longer game. So once you pick your difficulty level, you're going to grab a ship board of the appropriate level. The appropriate main board is placed where everyone can see it. You make adventure card decks. You're going to make four separate decks. You're going to build those and place them by the main board. Notably, one goes above the board while the rest go underneath. That'll matter in a minute. Ship tokens, starting crew cabins are placed, and all the ship tiles are shuffled face down on the center of the table. Then we start the building phase, first phase of the game. Now, in real time, players are going to draw tiles and add them to their ships following very specific building rules, like having to match the connectors on the edge of the tiles. Players also have the option to save tiles to place later, but they get a penalty if they don't use those up by the end of the building phase. Note when you're drafting, any unwanted tiles can be placed back on the table, but they go face up where other people can then snatch them up. Now, the different tile types include pipes, lasers, thrusters, cargo holds, hazmat cargo holds, batteries, shields, crew cabins, and alien life support systems. Each of these components is going to hopefully give you some advantage when you're trying to complete your flight in the final phase of the game. Just as a quick example, lasers are used to fight off pirates, crew cabins let you have more crew for salvage missions, and shields, which require batteries, but they can protect your ship from meteors and so on. So you're getting your truck ready for the big haul later on then. Yes. Now, while shipbuilding, you can also peek at the adventure cards that are below the main player board, which means you can look at three of the decks, but not the four. So you get some heads up on what you can expect to see on your run, and this can be very useful in guiding how you build your ship. It's hard to build the right truck if you don't know what you'll be hauling, and while you could look at all the cards, you'd waste time and everyone else would finish building well before you. Yeah, that's something very dependent on who you play this game with. Some people are meticulous and slow and don't want to touch the timer, and other people flip it at the first chance, which gets into the fact that this game is played in real time. At any point during this phase, any player can flip the timer over for the first time. Then when it runs out, anyone can flip it again. On each board, the timer can only be flipped to the last spot that's marked with an S for start by a player who's finished building. So that's one of the things where you technically can take as long as you want, but once someone finishes, they're going to flip that timer over and it has one more time to run out. And once it ends, everyone must stop building. Now the orders players complete their ships in also determines your starting position on the main board, which is just a circular track that shows the relative position of the players in relation to each other. Round and round we go. Now, once all players have finished building their ships, you go through what's called the pre-launch stage. This is a stage where you're going to make sure everyone's ship is legal. You're going to collect various tokens to place on your ship. Things like the batteries get energy tokens, crew cabins get astronauts, and potentially aliens if you have a life support system attached. Now, aliens are cool because aliens actually replace two astronauts, which is kind of bad because you have less crew. But each alien either gives you a bonus to your lasers or your thrusters for the common flight. No point in going out on a mission if you can't have crew and fuel, after all. Finally, we get to the flight. All the adventure card piles, all four of them, are shuffled together. The player in the lead on the position track flips over the top card, and everyone encounters that card. 
That continues card after card until the deck runs out. Now, adventure cards you face include planets, which you can land on to collect cargo, open space, where you get to crank up your engines and improve your position on the track, meteors, which can badly damage your ship, and enemies like pirates and slavers, abandoned ships and stations, and of course, the dreaded combat zone and more. So life in space, adventures, hazards, riches, and loss, the parts we actually wanted to see in the Han Solo movie. <laughs> so during, during many encounters, your ship's going to be at risk, right? This is usually in the form of meteors or enemy laser fire. When this happens, you find out what direction the attack is coming from from the card. It'll show like small meteors from your right or a blaster shot from the rear. You're then going to roll 2d6 and look on your player board to determine which section of your ship would be hit by this attack. Now, different attack types can be stopped in different ways. Small meteors bounce off your ship unless it happens to have an open component showing at that spot. Large meteors, though, have to be shot down by lasers. Now, laser fire can only be blocked by shields, and big lasers, which thankfully there aren't many of, can't be blocked by anything, including shields. You're just going to lose a piece. Now, when a component is hit, it has to be removed from your ship. In addition, though, you now have to make sure that everything else is still connected to your ship. And if it's not, that whole section is going to be lost as well, and that can lead to quite the chain reaction. Lose a wing and suddenly half your flight systems and storage are lost. Too bad, so sad. All part of the game. Now, things like planets, abandoned ships, and stations can be investigated. Now, doing so could cost you crew and always cost you time, moving you back on that position track. Now, the rewards are usually worth it as long as you can afford the cost, with most wards, rewards being cargo cubes or credits. Now, cargo cubes must be stored in cargo holds that you built onto your ship, and hazmat storage is only able to hold, or sorry, hazmat goods can only be held in hazmat storage, though technically a hazmat storage can be hold any goods. Now, I'll leave the rest of the adventure cards and the components for you to discover on your own. All right. Well, time to uh, go for Discover the Mysteries of the Cosmos on your own space truck. Now, once you get to the end of the adventure deck for this flight, the flight's over. You've gotten to your destination. You are then awarded credits, money, and points, both being the same, interchangeable in this game. Players get points for their final position. First, of course, scoring more than fourth. Selling cargo cubes with different cargo cubes being worth different amounts of money with the hazmat ones, of course, being worth the most. And the prettiest ship gets award. That's the one with the least open connectors at the end of the run. Finally, players lose one point for each damaged component in the storage area of the board. Either stuff left over from when they were building their ship they failed to place or stuff that got destroyed on their journey. Now note, unlike the original printing of the game, there's no limit to how high this penalty can be. After taking that penalty, player with the most credits wins. Sell stuff and don't have gaping holes in your ship. Got it. Now what I just described is the default way of playing Galaxy Trucker now. Now this method of play is fast, furious, and highly random. Build a ship, go on a run, get points, done, game's over. Now the rules do present another way to play, which they call the transgalactic trek. This method of play takes much longer and adds a brand new element to the game that did not exist in the original of titles. When playing a transgalactic trek, you start off by selecting a number of title tiles based on the number of players. Each title lists a goal for the players to try to accomplish during their run. For example, the freight hauler will be awarded to the player who has the most individual cargo hold tiles with at least one cube in it at the end of the run. Another example is the master engineer who is awarded points to the players who is awarded, sorry, to the player whose ship has the most components still left in it at the end of the run. Now there are a total of six different titles and you are gonna use at most four per game. So basically just achievement goals for, bo for bonus VP like most people are used to in games. Yep, pretty much. Though there is some interesting stuff they did with these titles once you've earned them. So once you know what titles are up for grabs, you're then gonna play a level one game. In full, including all the rules I already described, though instead of getting points for the most beautiful ship, you're going to hand out those titles. So you're going to look at each title and give the title to the player who earned it. Now, it is possible for a player to earn more than one of these here, and each one's going to give the player two credits at the end of the first run. Interesting, once points are handed out, no one's allowed to have more than one title. So they then donate that title to a player who didn't earn one. So at the end of round one, every player will have one title, which they place face up in front of them. 
bragging rights, except for the people who had to get theirs handed to them. Yeah, I think it's a it's a t ball game where everyone gets a trophy. There's there, there's there's some socialism going on here. Now at level two, you then play another run. Same deal. Only difference from the core game is that each player should be building in order to defend their title, whatever titles in front of them. Because at the end of the run, if a player qualifies for the title in front of them, they earn four bonus credits this time. Then they get to flip the title over to its other side, which is the gold side. Now, no, these are not redistributed. These titles aren't redistributed. You are stuck with the one you earned in the first round. So you're defending your title as opposed to getting something new. And if you don't have whatever that title states, you get nothing. So it's the same achievements all over again in round two. So yes. if you got the, the most haul or whatever, you have to do that same thing again in round yes, two. That's correct. Now the gold sides of the tiles include even more difficult challenges. So sticking to the two examples I gave before, the freight hauler now has a rule that if they place two cargo holds next to each other, neither can actually hold cargo. Yet they still are trying to be the person with the most cargo holds with cargo in. And the master engineer has to start the game by putting two tiles in reserve. Then after everyone else is done building, they have to show off their awesome thing by placing those two tiles in the holds in their ship. And if they can't, they get penalized. So since they're only a, a couple or four points, it seems like not getting the bonus after second round isn't the end of the world. Is it recoverable if you, you miss it and don't flip over to gold? I think it is, but in the final round of the game, again, you do a level three run. So you've now moved up to the biggest ship, the longest run. At the end, you again check to see if you defended your titles. A defended silver title is now worth six. That is a significant amount of points, whereas a defended gold is worth 12. The thing is, those gold restrictions are hard. So I don't know. Again, it very much this game very much depends on who you're playing with and how quick they're building. If you're playing with some nice slow players that give you time to perfectly plan out your ship, you might be a little more worth trying to go for the gold. But if you're with players who just can't wait to get their ship built and want to go with a half-built ship just to make everyone else panic, those golds may be unreachable. Now, one of the things in this version of play, which I think should be obvious, but in case it isn't, is that your credits actually carry over for each of them of three rounds. So you complete round one, you keep your points. And then in the next round, you keep your points. And the next round, you keep your points. What's kind of devastated in this version of the game is there's no maximum penalty for lost components. So you can actually lose the points you made in one round if you do really terrible in the next. Ouch. So there's quite a few small but significant changes here, it seems. What is it you thought of this new edition of Galaxy Trucker, and how does it compare to that original from 2007? Okay, so I have been a fan of Galaxy Trucker pretty much since it was first printed. Again, 2007, I actually think I got my copy in 2008. That fact hasn't changed. I still dig Galaxy Trucker. Galaxy Trucker is one of my favorite games. I'm happy to have it in my collection. The 2021 printing of Galaxy Trucker does nothing to take away from my joy in playing this game. Now, the most noticeable change everyone's going to see right away is the new box size, the new box art, and the new price point. And I've got to say, I can't help but be happy with this. It makes a game I love more accessible to a wider range of gamers, and honestly, it gives me a better way to put it on my shelf because smaller box is better when you run out of space. Certainly a bonus to have more people to play with for you and CGE. Very true. Now, another noticeable change that doesn't affect the gameplay is the new artwork and graphic design. Everything basically got a new coat of paint. And I will say overall, this is for the best. Even the various tokens have been upgraded. So the cargo cubes are now clear plastic and look a little cooler, whereas they were wooden cubes before. Uh, the higher quality astronauts and aliens, just everything's just polished up and a little bit nicer. And I noticed the uh, the box cover we've got up here uh, really pops more and stands out compared to the original. Yeah, I agree. And all of the art kind of has that, that more poppy, a little higher contrast, a little brighter colors. Now, one of the most significant design changes is the addition of the two-sided main boards. So instead of one main board that sits in the middle of the table, never changes, and you put a tile over it for what era you're playing, this actually changes depending on what round you're playing. There's different amount of spots for the hourglass. The actual track is different for how many spots are on it. Where players start in relation to each other, depending on where they finished, also changes. Now, part of that's pretty big, right? Because in the old game, when you finished building your ship, you had a, I don't know what you call those games, but one of those games where you had to grab a tile before anyone else is. They removed that. 
when you're done, you say you're done, you pick up your ship, you put it on spot one. Then the next player says, picks up the ship and hoists it on part two. I really dig that. That is a very welcome change for me. Yeah, mad grabs are rarely an elegant mechanic. Now, the shipboards themselves have been redesigned with really impressive visitors, are significantly smaller while still giving you a full-size grid, like the same size grid. The actual squares you're putting your tiles on, size has not changed. Now, as for the ships themselves, the level one and three ships are original, identical to the original. No change at all in number of tiles or where they go. The level two ship, though, is actually two squares smaller. And there's no level three B ship. That was the one that kind of looked like the Enterprise that was in the original game that you actually put horizontally instead of vertically. Or sorry, vertically instead of horizontally. That does not exist at all. Now, while I admit I liked having four ships versus three, like that's just, I get more content. I have another ship I can build. I do understand that removing this option is part of what kept the price point down because now you don't need a separate player board for that other ship. Now, the nice part, though, is due to the fact the grids are the same size, I don't see a reason you couldn't use the original ships or any of the expansion ships or any of the ones people have put out as downloadable content with this as an expansion. So mixing and matching between sets is workable for those who choose to and happen to have access to all that content. Exactly. Now, another change with the ships, I already mentioned this, that there's no longer a maximum penalty for destroyed parts. And as I've said, this, excuse me, as I've said, this is a significant change that encourages players to build better ships, which is a nice offset to some other difficulty tweaks in the game. These difficulty changes come in the form of the composition of the adventure cards. While the cards are almost a one-to-one -one match from the original with exactly the same distribution of cards, there's just as many meteors, just as many pirates, just as many planets. There are some very small tweaks that it took me having to put them side by side to notice. Now, in particular, one planet now gives better quality resources, and almost all the meteor cards have been modified in both the number of meteors, the size of the meteors, and which direction they come from. Overall, in this new printing, there are less meteors than the original edition. Now, this does have the effect of making this new edition feel slightly easier than usual, the original, with ships finishing runs more intact than I'm used to. So it was noticeable enough of a change for you to pick up on. I mean, you, you pointed that out yeah. the first time you played. Um, do you think most people would notice that? Honestly, it depends how much you played Galaxy Trucker and how good you were at it. Because when you play Galaxy Trucker the first time, you just build a ship and you've got open connectors all over the place. You very quickly learn that outside open connectors on the outside of your ship are terrible because small meteors only take out an open tile. So one of the first things you're going to learn to do is make sure your outside edges are all safe. Then you're going to learn things like, you know what, it's 2D6 and the number seven is what's going to get hit most often. And I want to make my valuable stuff out at the threes and fours. Or, or sorry, the threes and whatever, eights or whatever's on the far end. I guess it'd be the nines. Threes and nines would be the opposite ends. Once you know stuff like that, even the original game gets easier. And it's like, I'm going through more successful because the small meteors don't matter to me. Well, this is even more true because for one, if you're playing with experienced players, you know this, plus there are now less meteors as well so that when stuff does get destroyed, there's less chance stuff's going to get blown up. But I don't know. I, like, I think you have to have played Galaxy Trucker enough to have gotten to the point where you no longer just place every tile you draft on your ship somewhere because you're trying to build a ship as quick as possible. If you reach any level of expertise, I have a feeling you might notice it. The thing is, though, you don't use every card every game. It is just as likely as in the original game, you face no meteors at all. It can still happen. But when you do face meteors, they may be a little easier. Fair enough. So the most significant change here is the whole basic way to play the game. Uh, you can really see this if you look at the two board game geek listings and look at things like the playtime. I mean, the basic way to play now is pick a level, build ships, fly through, score, done. It's weird to me. Like, that was the learning game in the original. To me, it's always been about completing multiple runs in a row. Now, what they've done is they took what, to me, was a medium-weight real-time Euro and made it into a quick tile-based shipbuilding game that could actually be a filler. That first learning run, we were able to finish in 10 minutes the first time, depending on how quick people build ships. This in a way, though, is good because it makes the game even easier to learn than the original, especially with that super simple quick tutorial. Now, I think this is fantastic for new players 
and makes Galaxy Trucker more of a family game, a family weight game, making it approachable to more people. But this could be a big disappointment for long-term fans, but they thought of this. They also gave you the transgalactic track mode of play. A little something for everyone. Now, this transgalactic track basically matches the old way to play the game with the new title rules. And I got to say, I like the title rules a lot. This adds a new level of depth and strategy to the existing game. Having the tiles face up at the start has the bonus of giving players direction and adds a new level of player interaction because the titles are based on having the most of something. So how you build your ship will potentially impact the score of other players. Previously in Galaxy Trucker, there was no way to chase the point leader. Now, if I see someone flip over their gold and they're trying to get the most crew, I can build my ships to make sure I have the most crew just to deny them. That was an aspect that didn't even exist in the original game. Unlike uh, hate drafting to build friendships. Yes. <laughs> now, overall, these changes in the 2021 edition of Galaxy Trucker combined to do a couple of things. The first of the game is now more accessible to a wider range of gamers due to its lower price point, easier learning curve, and shorter game time. Second, this edition of Galaxy Trucker is also designed for long-term fans, and the new Transgalactic Trek mode of play adds depth, direction, and more player interaction than even the original had. A more accessible game that also features more depth with optional rules? How can I complain about that? Especially at a lower price point. So if building a spaceship out of tiles in real time, then watching that ship traverse dangerous space, and hopefully arriving at its destination somewhat intact, sounds fun to you, and you don't already own Galaxy Trucker, go pick up this new edition. Mm -hmm. This version of the game is just as much fun as the original, while being easier to learn and playable in a shorter time frame. Now, if you happen to be like my wife and can't stand real-time games and hate playing games where there's a timer looming over your head, Galaxy Trucker is probably not going to be the game for you. Also, if you don't like games where you build something only to watch it blow up, you're also going to want to stay away from this one. This is all about watching to see what happens and finding joy in both success and failure. I have to admit, it's the first round that somewhat puts me off the game, that real-time portion. Yeah, the real-time port, and that is something that you can, obviously, if you really want to, just ignore. And again, it's so player-dependent. It depends if someone flips that timer. You can literally play, and no one flips the timer until everyone's built. The timer is kind of an optional rule, but every time I play, there's always some jerk at the table that flips it over. <clears throat> That'd be me. Now, for those of you who already own Galaxy Trucker, I, I honestly don't know what to tell you. I, I'm going to leave the final decision to you. I, I have no definitive answer for this. I'm not sure if it's worth it for you. Now, I got to say, for that low price point, like that's it's like one third the cost of a regular game nowadays. And the fact that technically everything here can be combined with everything else, not just the core game, but like the big expansion, another big expansion, the anniversary event, and all the fan created content, it could totally be worth picking up this update. While I dig the new rule changes, you could also just pick this up and continue to play the game as you have for years. Play a three trip thing without titles. That's personally fine. Well, I got to say, I really like the title rules. So what I would probably do is I, I like having that bit of direction at the start of each build. So if anything, I would be more likely to grab those and use them with the various different ship builds in the old game and throw those in as well. There you go. A solid reprint of a solid game. Totally agree. Now, what I plan on doing right now is keeping both copies and they're going to serve two different purposes. This new edition is going to be my public play copy of Galaxy Trucker where I bring it out to public events where I don't know who's going to be showing up and use it to introduce this great game to new players. But when playing at home and sitting down with experienced Galaxy Trucker players, I'm probably going to bring out the original game along with some of the big box expansions I've collected over the years. And I'm going to sit down and play a traditional game, but I am pretty sure I will be using the full Trek rules from the 2021 printing of Galaxy Trucker, including those title ties. Fair enough. Well, that's it for our review of Galaxy Trucker, the new 2021 edition. Let us know what you thought about this real-time sci-fi shipbuilding game in the comments, and also feel free to check out the more detailed review, written review, over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, number one for me. 
everyone's looking forward to my opinion on this one. I'm working on it. I've only played it once yet. Hot off my Christmas pile and off the relative new hotness as far as games are concerned is Lost Ruins of Arnak. I only played once. And wow, is there a lot going on in this game? Rule book, extremely clear. Component quality is up there, like really up there, really fantastic. But just the board is so busy. You have nine different resources you're tracking in this game. Now, thankfully, that's done pretty easily. You've got five resources that you are collecting and getting counters for. And these are nice physical components that you make piles of, right? Like you're collecting these. But then you also have travel resources, we'll call them. So to get to different parts on the board, you have to spend foot feet, like foot symbols, to go to the base camp. But to explore this half of the board, you need a vehicle, uh, a boat, uh, or sorry, a, a automobile. To go to this half, you need a ship, you need a boat. To get to the top, you need even more. And then you can always hire a, um, a flight. You can hire someone to fly you somewhere, and you can later buy cards with flights on them. So the hard part is that most of the cards you have produce one or the other. So it's, I can spend this to get an arrowhead, which I can use later to do something, or I can spend it to move here. And then the, the travel rules are really neat, where one can sub for another. So despite the fact that you need boots to go here, well, you can use a car or a boat to go there or a plane. And it works down that way. So planes can also be used instead of cars or boats. But you can't use cars or boats as planes. And it's got this little tree. It's, it's clear to understand when you see it, but this is just it. There's all that. And what you're doing with this is you're exploring a lost world, we'll call it. Because that's basically what it goes for. I know a lot of people call this the Indiana Jones game. To me, it has much more of a lost world feel with huge giant monsters guarding everywhere. You're going to spend exploration tokens to open up worker placement spots. But then you only get two people. It's a worker placement game where you only get two people to put out. And then you have deck building. So you've got a hand of cards, but you only ever draw five times in the entire game. So think of a deck builder. Think of DC deck building or any other deck building game you enjoy and think that you only get to draw five times ever. Like, that's ridiculous. And then there's this whole track on the right-hand side that you're spending those consumable resources on that you're building up to go up this track, which represents you exploring the temple, the, the lost temple, and trying to get to the temple. But in addition to exploring, you also have to take notes. So you're actually moving up the track twice, once for exploring the temple and another one for making research notes about the temple. And that's spending resources. And then after you explore an area, monsters show up. And if you run away from the monsters, you get these bad cards in your deck. You get these fear cards. And while fear cards give you boots, so it's you run away to home base, right? There's a neat tie in there. You're also getting minus one point at the end of the game for these because they're terrible and they fill your deck. And again, you're only drawing five times. And then you never shuffle. Your entire, well, you shuffle, but you don't shuffle your deck. You shuffle every card you played that round and then put it on the bottom of your deck. So there's a little bit of, um, what is that game called? I can't remember it. The Aeon's End going on here. And along with that, there's artifacts. So the cards you can buy are equipment, which costs money. But then you can use your exploration to discover artifacts. But then to power the artifacts, you have to have tablets. And like all of this is happening at once. It is so overwhelming. Like we're sitting there going, like the first turn of the game, here's my hand of five cards and here's this board spread out. And I'm like, what do I do with this? <laughs> and like completely, D and I completely lost. And then one of the things I mentioned to D was that I've heard a lot of people talk about how They've ignored the exploration track, and lots of people have finished the game without ever getting to the Lost Ruins, never getting to the top of the track. So she just was like, okay, I'm going to get to the top of the track, so I have focus. And me, I started off going, I'm going to buy lots of cards, because the cards give me wild cards that I'll be able to do lots of things. And while I didn't plan it, I didn't click in that I'm only going to get to draw five times. So I literally just put a ton of stuff in my deck I'd never draw, because the deck was too big. But every card you buy was worth points. And I thought D had destroyed me. Here she is at the top of the track. She's reached the Lost Ruins, and she's documented her entire path. The only thing she hasn't done is run away with any of the treasure, and that's only because she misunderstood a rule. She thought she had to buy the lower-cost ones instead of the higher-cost ones, but you can actually buy in any order if you've got the resources. Well, it ended up we tied, because I had bought so much crap with my money. I had so many points. I had 23 points of just stuff in my deck. Meanwhile, she had 23 points approximately for going up the track, and it kind of balanced each other. And the rest of us, yeah, we each killed a few monsters. I think we each killed four monsters or something like that. We each killed three because we have 15 points each in monsters. 
but we finished and we were just like, well, I don't even know. And, and honestly, it wasn't even a game where I'm like, oh, next time I would play that differently. I'm like, yeah, I played differently, but I still don't know what the right way to play is. And I think that's fantastic. Like, it didn't feel like her way worked and my way worked. They both worked and they were both very different. And man, was it fun. Like, is this ever well done? I personally felt the two meeples was really punishing and I kind of hated it while playing, but I'm sure that was supposed to be part of it. The fact, and the other thing that's very different from deck builders, this is not a play your entire hand, do your turn, you're done. It's more terraforming Mars. It's you do your action, which could involve playing cards. Then I do an action, which could involve playing cards. And then you do your action until you pass. And the round doesn't end until everyone passes. So despite the fact you only have five cards in your hand, because you have all these resources and on tracks to go up, you can actually do a lot more. It's not just here, put up my hand face up and go, yeah, I got two resources. I buy one of these and do this. That's completely gone. This this feels so different from every other deck builder because of that. Yeah, I have to say I am super eager to play this. Who knows when that will ever happen? But uh... <laughs> Well, this one is on Tabletop Simulator. Yeah, so, it is. So. so we can probably sit down and play a game. Once you guys uh, you're, you're feeling you're rough, or I'd suggest it tonight because I'm sure D <laughs> would be up for it. All right, next, another one from the Christmas pile Star Wars Unlock. So, first off, I've never played an Unlock game. I assume every Unlock game works the same, especially based on the fact they give you an intro that kind of tells you how the different card types interact. And it was fascinating to me to see how this does things different from other escape room games. Like we played quite a few of the exit games. We played various murder mystery games, Maple Brook case, escape mail and stuff like that. I've never played an unlock. Started off with the intro scenario. Fair warning. One of the things you need to do is don't plan on playing this for the night. We're like, it's new year's Eve. We're going to do this with the kids. They're going to watch their animal crossing ball. And then we're going to play star Wars unlock expecting like a game. No, the intro is literally just to keep you out of play. It is super simple took us under five minutes to finish. And that was with a mistake penalty of one minute. So really only took us about four minutes. Um, my daughter was 14 and acting 14. So that was slightly amusing because she was like, no, I don't want to play. So we were like, New Year's Eve, this is what we're going to do. And she's like, nah, I don't feel like it. So we're like, screw it. We're going to play without you. Well, she was the one that solved the one problem that we didn't have the penalty. She's like, well, look, look at the, the thing here. And I'm like, okay. And then we finished. I'm like, so did you like that? She's like, oh, yeah, I really like that. That was really well done. That was very different from the exit games. Obviously, she didn't like the exit games as much as I thought she did. But she's 14, so maybe not. Maybe she loved those two. Intro is fantastic. Teaches you the different card types. Yes, it's easy. It, it's The thing we missed was really obvious to see what we missed once we missed it. Um, I love the fact they actually took the time to make a Star Wars specific intro. You're, you're a Imperial spy who's been captured by rebels in a cell you at the breakout. I like that. And it had Star Wars music and stuff. I'm like, that was really cool. Just again, don't be like, we're playing this night. It's, it's, it's 10 minutes at the mo absolute most to play through this. So like, that's your, you do this, then you play another game. So the next day, we sat down and played through the first full adventure. I don't know what to call it. So the, the, all these unlock games are now settled in box sets of three, three games at once. Okay. All of them are. They used to be individual small boxes that were pretty long. Now they're sold in, in one box with three at a time. And it's like that for all unlock games. This one only comes that way, where some of the older ones, one of the things to watch for for fans of unlock is to not buy a game you already have because of the way they started distributing them. But anyway, this one's standalone. This was even cooler. Like, I got to say, I really do dig the way the system works. This very much felt like a Star Wars story uh, it's called escape from hoth and yes you're taking part at the beginning of empire strikes back yeah you're doing a couple things that seem very similar to what some of the characters did <laughs> but it is a standalone story with interesting things happening um there were some real surprises here i've got to say there was a jump scare which again i'm always impressed when there's jump scares and something like this there was a card i flipped over that i literally like you know wasn't expecting that on the card um, the, the interactions of the cards are really neat. I'm not going to get over how to play an unlock game, not here for a week in review. When I do a full review, maybe I'll get into it. I will say the difficulty was pretty much perfect level towards easy. There was some really, really blatantly silly, obvious stuff, um, especially right at the beginning of this, but this is considered the easiest of the three in this box. And I think it's also designed for people who've never played an unlock game before. So it's supposed to be easy. Um, 
there was one exception. There was one puzzle that honestly, I don't think we ever would have got um, just because it required more out of the box thinking than we were applying to it. And I got to say, I can almost see that as a problem because you're introducing the system to players. I don't know if they should expect you to stretch that system or possibly break that system when they just went, this is how the game plays. And then they threw in something that kind of twists that a bit. Again, I don't want to spoil anything. I, this was fine. We used a hint. The hint pointed us in the right direction without being obvious. So I appreciated that. And honestly, one of the things most people do need to learn is taking a hint one of these games is not a failure. There's a reason they rank you out of five. You're not going to rank one because you used one hint. You're probably not even going to rank one if you actually get a full solution to one puzzle. Now, I do have one complaint. These are games that are a combination of app and card game. Now, it is mostly card game, but you do have to use the app for different things. And there is a certain color of cards where you basically say, I am using something. And you put it into the app to tell it what it's using, and you then get an interface to interact with whatever that thing is. Well, there was a point where we had to put in four codes. We had done all the work to gather the four codes, and it ends up it looked like there were actually five different codes available, and we had found all five, but we needed four. We sat down with the app, and at that point, my daughter was controlling it, my youngest daughter. And had her punch in the first code, she hits okay, and it goes, eh, eh, one minute penalty. And I'm like, what? Which card did you type? And my daughter does have some disabilities and sometimes difficulty reading numbers. So we just assumed she typed in the number wrong. So I gave her another one of the four codes, or of the five, that was an easier number, right, that she couldn't mix up. Eh, eh. And I'm like, okay, what the heck's going on? Let me try. So I went and put the code in, and I'm like, what is it doing? Like, I'm putting the codes in. Well, it ends up, it wanted all four codes at once. It didn't want me to hit enter one and hit enter. It wanted me to type in all four codes, then hit enter. That affected our final score and hurt our time. And that was frustrating because that wasn't us. We had done the work. We had solved the puzzle. We knew what the codes were. We had the right codes in front of us. Yet we were penalized for the app not working the way we thought it did. Although, I mean, arguably, the, the figuring out how the app worked was part of the puzzle, I guess. I guess, I guess. is one way to look at it. I, to me, uh, but originally I wrote, this sounds like a modern VHS game, and it doesn't quite sound that bad to me hearing more about it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of card play, but there's still a level of VHS game there, like, you know, old DVD games there for me. And that's not for me, but that's, you know what? I, you know, if the kids are liking it, that's awesome. I would say it's not like almost not at all a VHS okay. game. So there's no audio from the app. It doesn't tell you the story. It oh, doesn't okay. play music. So it's not like you turn on the app and watch something, then interact. It's all on the cards. Oh, okay. What you will do is you'll get to a door. You can't get past and you have to enter a code. And all you do is you tap on enter code and put in the code. Three times during this adventure, we interacted with objects and they let you do fun things with your phone. I, I, again, I don't want to spoil no, fair. anything on this, but they weren't sit and passively watch ever. It was all interactive. And I got to admit, there was a really good one that I, that I got right away, but I, there was a really good use. Yeah, it's more AR, we'll say. More AR and VR style stuff than... than it, it's a way to add in the components that are in the exit games without needing physical components in a way. Right. So you're saving money on product. That's fine. Yeah. Now, I just look forward to more. We got two more to play. After that, I'm definitely probably going to be willing to check out more Unlock games. I, I don't know if we have a contact to try to check out more. Maybe we'll just go shopping with the kids. Uh, the kids did dig it. One of the things, though, is it says play six players. There wasn't a lot that we could all work on at the same time. It was very much reveal the new card, read what's on the new card, and then someone else read it, and we all try to solve the puzzle. And I have a feeling more difficult ones, maybe you'll split up. And yes, you had a thing where someone could be looking at one card for a clue while someone else is trying to combine a couple things, but there really wasn't a lot for everyone to do. And, and using a phone, what we did is took turns using the interact with the app thing, but there's only one phone. And some of the stuff you were doing very much involved one person using the phone, no one else could lean over and look. So that, that was one aspect, which I, I think is going to be an issue with all unlock games. Big bonus, though, you don't destroy anything. These are infinite really replayable by multiple groups and players as long as you have the deck of cards. There is nothing to stop me from handing this deck of cards over to you, and you download the free app for yourself. So anyone can play these, though no way whatsoever you can replay. 
once you've solved it, it it's a murder mystery type right. of thing right there's no murder mystery in this one but like there there were no branching paths there were no other ways to do things right one they, them, yeah. i'd be able to play it through and probably finish it in two minutes i probably still have to use some of the cards to look up some of the codes because i don't remember them but like it's these are not replayable but it's not destroyed in any Next, another game with kids, Disney Sidekicks. Um, played it with the girls for the first time. They were very, very interested in it. They thought it looked fantastic. Um, it had a real hard time getting them to put the miniatures down so we could play. Uh, they, in particular, loved the three fairies that were one miniature that you could split up. So it's three separate fairy miniatures. And when you pass another hero, you can attack, or sorry, sidekick, you can attach a fairy to them to defend them. But then you keep moving the other two around and you can't split the third time. That in the fact that then when the fairies got hurt, they flew back to the others. Like that was just a fascinating concept to them. Um, they dug the asymmetric abilities, kind of reminded them of villainous, where the bad guys had different powers. Um, we had Maleficent down to two health, and we had rescued two of three heroes. So all we had to do to win was one more hero and hit Maleficent twice more. And while well, we lost, because that's what happens in that game. Uh, my kids were very frustrated by the, it felt like it was going great, and then suddenly it wasn't, which I've got to say is a feature of many um, cooperative card games or cooperative games. That's the biggest problem with pandemic. Pandemic's going great until you get your first couple epidemics and outbreaks, and then all of a sudden it's a chain reaction. It's terrible. You have that in Disney sidekicks. Um, in particular, the cards that say place something where you are and adjacent spots are terrible, whether they're place guards where the villains are, they're place villagers where you are those can cause everything to just end almost instantly. It's went over okay. Um, one of the things is I have now read that Maleficent is the hardest. Uh, what Maleficent does is put um, first tokens out on the spots. And if anything is sent to that spot, it instantly goes in the tower and getting five things in the tower, or whatever they are, lose. So having two spots start the game filled and then her putting out more curses makes it way harder than any of the others. Whereas some of the other buildings, like Scar just does a lot of damage. So as long as you can stay away from Scar, you're pretty good. And every time you hit him, he gets weaker. There's no, nothing's going to go in the castle because of Scar. Or for example, Hook has the, um, the pirate ship that goes around the board and shoots cannons at you. It could destroy you. And if any heroes lose, you do lose. But again, it's not putting anything in the castle. Well, what I do want to do is try it again without Maleficent to see if it's a little more done. But as for my kids, despite the fact they seem to be having fun while they were playing and the fact they loved the miniatures, we finished. I said, all right, you want to try again? Because that's usually what happened. We were close, right? One hero and one villain away, two health left. Let's try again. No. And then literally the words, I don't have to ever play this again. And then the other daughter, yeah, please don't make me play this again. So from the mouth of babes, uh, this just fits what we've been saying about this game since the start, this is not a game for kids. This is a heavy, punishing, well, not heavy, heavier, somewhat complicated, very punishing, very difficult cooperative game, which just doesn't match the people that you think would be playing it. Yeah, talk talk about missing your, your key demographic there. Uh, interestingly, we're sort of having that same sort of thing. Uh, my daughter yesterday uh, came downstairs and was like, are you working today, dad? I'm like, yeah, I am. She's like, oh, because I want to play the I want to play the cardboard game, uh, which is what she's calling Hogwarts Battle. OK, um, a board game. it's a board game, but it's a card game. So it's a cardboard game. All right. Um, uh, so and I, I was hoping we'd get get to it uh, last night after dinner and it just didn't happen. But uh, we we got to it this afternoon and got a game in. And man, we. We uh, so the last time we sat down, we we blew through box one of the the book charms and potions, solid, um, solid play of that. Uh, had trouble with box two, mm -hmm. went back, figured out what we were doing wrong, and basically blew through it pretty well as well. Not box three, we've huh. been crushed twice by it. This time we were not only crushed, but partway through we were realizing we were playing extreme. We should have been far more crushed. Oh, we were okay. we were we were drawing one less card every round than we were supposed to be uh okay. that was pu like punishing card mm -hmm. um and so it this is box three of four is feeling a lot like monster box <laughs> and i'm not sure what if we're doing anything differently like it's like i'm not seeing you need more path. charms and potions obviously 
Well, the, the, that's part of the problem, actually, is what happens is in this third box, um, they add uh, bad potions. Oh, okay. Um, so you get, as, uh, as part of the negative effects that come up every turn, the, the Dark Arts bad. cards, you get potions that sit on you, and you have to put ingredients, you have to make these potions in order to get rid of them, rather than making okay. the good potions to gather them to your deck. And they, huh. it's, it's punishing. <laughs> But the problem I have with Hogwarts in general, and this goes for Monster Box as well, is so much of the game depends on what's in the market. The, no, the, the 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 draw of the villains. Oh, okay. Because yeah. you've got three villains up. Once once you're playing the game properly, once you've gotten mm -hmm. through the first however many boxes, and you're yeah, in the even we we haven't finished the first box, but we're at yeah. three villains. Right. So it, it you start with three villains out there, and there's always three villains up until you've killed everyone except Voldemort. Mm -hmm. And which the combination of those villains can just be utterly cruel, mm -hmm. especially when you start adding the other effects that come in. Like as you again, as you play, there are other things up on the board that are doing damage to you as well. Right. Um, and it just gets it, it just gets brutal. And Mountain Papa saying I wanted to burn the detention cards. I oh, see. I don't mind the detention cards anymore. Now they're they're not a problem. They're <laughs> They're they're simplistic now. Uh, it's it gets so much worse, and it, it was just we. It didn't feel as as heart wrenchingly horrible as the last time. I don't know if we hadn't played the extreme, it might have, um, but it was very obvious that you know we're just getting smoked here. <laughs> oh, you don't want an easy no nope, co-op no, game, but you don't want it too hard either. That's such a hard well, balance. The, the the weird balance was we really did kind of blow through box one and two, right? right? I mean, we did have to replay box two, but it's because we hadn't read ahead. And when we flipped a card, the next card that we hadn't looked at, we right. weren't prepared for that effect. So we didn't have the right way to get That's that. usually how I play it too, right? Like it's yeah, like yeah. the first time in the dungeon, you learn where the traps are. The yeah, next yeah. time you go, you know, no, to avoid them. And so, yeah, the next time we played, we kind of blew through it because we knew what to prepare for. You know, all of yeah. I got to make sure you have that term. I have this term and that blah, blah, blah. Um, I, now it helps the player count the five, doesn't it? Um, it can, yeah. So you can. I'm just wondering can, if that would help at all. Is having well, the problem is like each the play same problem characters. is every time you play, you're getting those dark hearts. You know, every yeah, for every player, it, you're it, still it's, getting it's dark it's hearts. The, yeah, it's the same thing in sidekicks, right? Every, yeah. every player turn, there's an enemy enemy turn. It goes back to Shadows Over Camelot had that right. Evil advances, and then you get to go. Yep, is, is very much a co op thing. I just wonder if like the balance of powers, having every character's abilities. Because one of the things we did find with that game was who played in what player order, who sat where mattered. Right. Just based on like this person can heal. And if they get to go before this person who can do this thing, we actually found that we had a preferred seating order well, when we were playing sense. more regularly. I, I think part of the problem is um again now that we've got so like much if you don't content, if you don't have I don't remember who it is, like if you don't have Neville to heal, yeah, it's, it would healing. make everything more difficult. Absolutely. And Neville is, I, I'm always Neville because, yeah. <laughs> um, just so that we have a healer in the party. Right. Um, but the, there's so much content now that can negate people's okay. abilities as well. So it's like, all right, Neville's the healer, except half the time heal. when it gets to be my turn, no one's allowed to regain hearts. Right. So <laughs> tough. all, right. all my just turns a are thought. useless. I'm like, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Put all five players in play and see if that makes it any Well, and we may actually try. Like, none of us have ever played Ginny, who is the new character in, in yeah. the new box. Maybe maybe you need Ginny to win yeah. because you know, it's the new character. All right. All right. Next. next one for me is Nitwit. Um, we've been going pretty long, so I'm going to keep this pretty short. So New Year's Eve, Dee and I are sitting there. We've had a few drinks. We finished our game of Arnak. We're kind of sitting back trying to decide, do we go to bed? Do we watch some TV? What do we do next? And we fell into this thing where we're looking through my game shelves and I'm just like, oh, I need room. We have uh, our, my, my table is an eight by four table. That's been turned into a three by four table because there's five feet free that it's just games piled on it right now. And we're just kind of sitting there going, talking about game, like, Oh, we don't need that anymore. Let's get rid of that. Like, honestly, we're never going to, when are we going to sit down and go, let's play that. And then the next game, we're like, you know what? We have to get the deal. Be like, no, we got to keep that. It's awesome. And then there's a bunch of games that are in limbo, right? Where I'm like, Deus is one. Sean was talking about playing Deus. I got Deus. I played Deus a couple times. I enjoyed Deus, but it's complicated and it's hard to teach and it just never got to the table. I probably haven't played it in, I don't know. I don't know when it came out. Say seven years. Do I need Deus on my shelf? 
but maybe there's something in Zeus we're missing. Maybe it's another Castles of Burgundy. Castles of Burgundy is the perfect example of a game I've had on my shelf for 10 years that just recently we brought back out and fell in love with. And I'm like, oh, Castles of Burgundy, I can't sell that. So we're doing that. We're going through the shelf. And then D's like, Nitwit. Oh, I don't think I played that. And I'm like, what? You never played Nitwit? The Venn Diagram game? You never played that? I'm like, bring it down. Like, we've been drinking. This is a party game. This is a good one. So if you haven't played Nitwit before, it's a Venn Diagram game. I'm not going to describe it. Basically, you're going to put out some spools with circles and words on them. And what you have to do is find the word, find it it's something that applies to all the things that it's in the circle, right? So your spool number one is surrounded by, by dark, warm, and fishy. And you're like, okay, what the heck am I going to do with dark, warm, and fishy? And then you each write down what you think is something that's dark, warm, and fishy. And you do that for all 10 spools or whatever, right? So then you sit there and the round ends and everyone reads off their answers. And in general, it tells you accept whatever wants someone fit as long as it fits, right? And while with two players, it's a little silly because there's a whole voting system where you're like, no, I challenge you. There, there is no way that Swedish fish are dark, warm, and squishy. Like, yeah, they're fishy looking, but they're not dark. How can they be dark, right? It is a fun game. Deanna was sold on. She's like, yeah, okay, this is fun. We can keep this. Now, there is a big problem with this game, though. Sometimes you get card results, like dark, warm, and fishy. Due to that, you may want to sit down, and you must sit down before you start playing this with someone other than your wife, because you know what your own senses of humor are and what's acceptable, and talk about what types of answers are you going to allow during your game of nitwit. That is my only complaint about the game, because I think someone who was making these cards was intentionally trying to make it so the game can go there. Fair enough. Finally, we finished Quezzle. The reason I want to bring Quezzle up, I know we've been talking about it a lot, is I now have to revise my entire opinion on this one. We didn't quite get far enough to know just how good the end is. So one tip, you do not have to take any bits out of the puzzle. Remember how I talked about how we pulled out these things and we noticed that these were forming puzzles? Don't do any of that. You're jumping the gun, and it made a bit of a mess. You eventually get to a point where it tells you to pull stuff out of the puzzle, then start pulling stuff out. By the end, when the whole thing's done, and you've got your four figures assembled, and they're supposed to guide you, do that. Look at the four figures, figure out what the hint is, and follow it. There were some actual escape room puzzle moments here, but they weren't until literally the very end. You're completely done the puzzle. You've done all the sheets. You've done all the where's Waldo. Now all you have left is the final puzzle. So find the princess, right? And find out who, save the princess, find out who kidnapped her. There is some really fun stuff. There, there, there is one, one thing. So, so the way it's done is in box one, you've got the, 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 the newspaper for box one, but there's also a newspaper for the entire game. Once you finish that, it's going to lead you interesting places. Now this still isn't complicated. My 11 year old figured out where those clues led. And then you actually get some really well done app integration at the end. So one of the failings in this game is they had Kickstarter. Um, what do you call those bonus content? Stretch goals. Stretch goals. Thank you. Stretch goals to unlock AR content for each of the four puzzles. Well, all that's there is the first one for the Eagle. You can't do the others. And I actually thought that was it. Well, in the app, there's a part where you say final puzzle and you literally have to scan your final puzzle. No, all the pieces have to be back in at this point. So I was fighting with it, trying to get it to work. And what it was is I had to put everything back, which can get annoying because some of that other stuff is involved in some of the puzzle. Um, you scan it and then fun stuff happens. Some really, honestly, really well done AR. Um, I, I don't know how to describe it without spoiling it, but there's a really neat thing that happens. And then you literally get a reward screen that says you finished it. So if you played Quezzle and you've solved all the stuff and you've done some stuff with the app, unless you've seen something that says you have won Quezzle, you haven't finished because I actually know two people that had no idea that there was a further end to the end of the game. Overall, my kids loved it. They loved it so much that we're going to continue working with puzzle. They are going to send us one of their puzzles and we'll review one of their puzzles coming up. I know it's not a board game, but you know what? Puzzles to me are tabletop games. They may not be a competitive game, but I think they're tabletop games. And as usual, head over to Quezzle, uh, what are unidragon.com, wherever you, if you search Quezzle, you'll find it. Unidragon.com, you can save 10% if you use the code bellhop. Yeah, and I think these are fantastic. 
for the right market. Although we have pointed out the price point is steep mm -hmm. on this particular big box event sort of extravaganza. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of content. Uh, to be honest, their other puzzles cut. aren't cheaper. <laughs> right. It's it's all of their puzzles are are not cheap. I got to say, there is definitely something to be said. I've been talking with someone who is a puzzle fanatic, who is someone else who has it, who did not figure out the end bit, um, who are like, these are the best made puzzles I've played. They're perfectly cut. They've never had a piece stick or not fit. They've never had a missing piece. Just compared to your standard cardboard or press board puzzle, like this is a step above. None of them have scratched. They now glue them together and mount them on their walls. With the Quezzle in particular, they did a thing where they mounted on their wall, but then kept all the newspapers mm -hmm. so that people who come to their house can grab the newspapers and go find stuff in the puzzle. Ooh. So for a puzzle fan, these are worth it. Excellent. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So I did get a pile of unboxings done, five games, including um, some of the games from my Christmas wish list, my copy of Hero Quest, and some of my older stuff that's been sitting around for a while, including more Adventuria content. So watch for those to show up on YouTube. One of them went live today. Um, Dee wants us to play more Arnak. That's all she wants to do right now. She is obsessed with the game, having only played once. So I'm sure that's in our future. The kids really want to play the next chapter of Unlock, though I'm sure Mr. 14 will change her mind. Uh, well, Mr. 14? Ms. 14 will change her mind when we sit down to play whether she likes it or not. Um, I want to play Hero Quest. I am really looking forward to it. Um, that I, I need to explore the, what I grew up with. And, well, that's not even grew up. I was old by the time I was playing that game. I wasn't old, but I, I was not a kid when I played Hero Quest. I'm looking forward to playing some Hero Quest. Trying that out. The bad part, though, is uh, we're limited to four people in our house again. We are, uh, the numbers in Ontario are frightfully terrible. Uh, locally, we're looking at 600 cases a day, and that is with reduced testing. So despite the numbers possibly looking better in Ontario, the testing number has fallen off a cliff because they refuse to test people now. So as far as I can tell, the government's plan is if we don't test people, we won't have sick people. We, we, it, we're, we're playing don't ask, don't tell. I don't know what's happening. But anyway, we, um, unlike some people, do follow these restriction rules and won't be able to get together with Tori and Kat or our extended family to play games. So that's going to put a, 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 a ding in our plans for at least the pile of obligations. So one of the big ones that I feel bad about, I'm sorry, Jamie, but Charterstone's going to have to wait. That, that we are not playing until Tori and Kat can get together. Um, even Galaxy Trucker reviewing tonight, I probably would have got a couple more games in. But I played the original so many times, I didn't feel bad reviewing it. Um, Disney Sidekicks, I, I, I'm, I feel bad reviewing it because I want to play it with Tori and Kat because they haven't played not extreme and of all the people i game with i think they may enjoy the game the most and i would love to have a bit of a positive spin for that review so it's not just everyone hates the game i, I think personally think there's going to be a group of experienced gamers out there who like disney who like this game i just haven't found them yet and i might have them right at my table every other week or whatever but because we played extreme we don't know so I, I have no idea what's going to happen with some of our, our ongoing content. Aventuria, Deanna and I can still play, so we're good there. We can probably keep going through some of that. Doodle Dungeon is another one. I, we will try that with the kids, but I would have liked to have played that a bit more with more people. Like, especially not even be able to bring it to the extended family. D and I playing Doodle Dungeon with each other, I well, we should do it once just to review it as a two-player game. I don't think is going to get the impact as playing with more players. So... COVID restrictions throwing a wrench into everything yet again. All righty. Well, and you, I assume, have more Hogwarts battle coming. I do. It's it's still set up on the table uh, for uh, for another game tomorrow. Hopefully, we can figure out some solution to uh, find our way through Box Three. Maybe that's what I'll do. Since we are, we we, we do have the kids indeed a game with. Maybe we'll go try and finally finish <laughs> off the core box. I don't even remember what number we were on. I think we had unlocked all the things, but there was still one fight left to do to like beat the box. Right. But I think all the rules were in place. Right. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheehan. Thanks, Brian. David Miller Jr., who right now is just Dave. Thank you. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. 
and Jeff Seuss. We were so close. Like it was really looking like we were going to get the game together again and everything slipped back. Uh, so far that is now worse than ever. So sometime soon or later, we'll game again together, Jeff. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to let Sean get some sleep. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. I mentioned every episode, you can head to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop to support our show and offset some of the costs of putting this content out and help us to improve our setups. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. Stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.